Good afternoon. So this is the uh, fifth annual uh, New Frontiers of Poverty Research Conference. And I think uh, all the previous four have been really good. Um, this one may be our best. So really looking forward to it. And it's um, my pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Wes Moore, who will uh, get us going, give the keynote address. So um, Wes is the CEO of Robin Hood a Foundation, one of the largest anti-poverty forces in the nation. He's a best-selling author, a combat veteran, and a social entrepreneur. He grew up in Baltimore and the Bronx, where he was raised by a single mom. His first book, the Other Wes Moore was a New York Times bestseller, and it captured the nation's attention on the fine line between success and failure in our communities and in ourselves. That story has been optioned by Oprah Winfrey and HBO to be made into a movie. Other publications include the work Discovering Wes Moore and This Way Home. Moore is also the founder and former CEO of Bridge Ed U, an innovative tech platform addressing the college completion and job uh, placement crisis. Uh, he graduated from Valley Forge Military College and was Phi Beta Kappa at Johns Hopkins University. He also earned an MLIT in international relations from Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar. This is an abbreviated bio, but I love, I love the last line in his bio, which is that his proudest achievement is his wife and two children. Wes. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, first, Erwin, thank you so much, not just for the, uh, for the really remarkable uh, and, uh, and very generous introduction, um, but for the invitation and for having, having us here. And, and, I, and I say us uh, because we've got quite a few members of our Robin Hood team here, and we really are, are thrilled to be, uh, to be asked to be here and to be in attendance and to be part of this conversation. Uh, and, um, and to be part of a conversation that really focuses on two things that Robin Hood holds very dearly. Uh, and that's being data-driven, and that's being heart-led. In fact, one of Robin Hood's values is actually that, that Robin Hood will be data-driven and be heart-led. That the data matters. Understanding quantitatively and qualitatively what's happening in our society and what adjustments do we have to make to protect those, particularly those who are our most vulnerable, the ones who need and deserve champions most. And the ability to come here and to, to, to spend time at a gathering that every year focuses on exactly that is incredibly meaningful. Because also I think the thing that data continues to show us is how that continues to morph and change. How the work continues to morph and change. How the needs continue to morph and change. And also then how we deal with it. What efforts we put into it needs to also be just as quick, just as malleable, and just as assertive. So thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, thank you to Jane. Thank you to Chris. Thank you for all the partnership that you all have given us for so long. Uh, you know, we, we've been honored since 2012 to be in direct partnership with Columbia University with the Poverty Tracker. And really what the Poverty Tracker is, it's a way to have real-time data on 4,000 households. 4,000 households in New York that are some of our most vulnerable households, but not just understanding their reality, but helping to also understand the cause. So this is not just simply about how can we be expert voyeurs in the poverty fight, but it's about how are we digging into the elements that frankly are putting people and keeping people in poverty, and then how can we be creative about ways to be able to address those very real dynamics, 4,000 people. We just recently had a, had a, had a poverty tracker uh, data that was released yesterday, which indicated and showed how 100,000 New Yorkers will lose their homes this year. 
poverty tracker analysis that has helped us in our own strategic planning and our own strategic thinking. The data matters. And being able to take that data, make it useful, make it tangible, and make it actionable also matters. When I first became the, uh, the CEO of Robinhood, now uh, about, uh, well, I just, just started my, my, my third year at Robinhood, one of the first things that we did in coordination with the entire team and in coordination actually with our board of directors, and I want to give a special shout out to Alex and Bob, one of our, one of our board members, um, who has just been an uh, in, uh, uh, unbelievable, po unbelievable poverty fighter in this role and beyond. So thank you, Alex, for being here today as well. We decided that we wanted to do a true intellectual audit of the challenge that we were working on. A true intellectual understanding of what is the difficulty that we are seeing when it comes to combating poverty and where can we add the most value in that fight. And there's a couple things that became very clear and frankly our partnership with Columbia University helped to illuminate it. It wasn't just the reality of what we see within poverty and how challenging poverty is. A, there was another reality that stuck in. And that's how sticky poverty is. Considering the fact that according to our own poverty tracker data, that 42% of New Yorkers, almost half, have been in poverty at some point over the past three years. 42%. Looking at the reality that even for a person who's able to move out of poverty, that 34% of people who are able to move out of poverty, within a year, they'll be back in poverty. So it's not just the, the traumatic and terroristic realities that we see when it comes to poverty. It's the fact that even for people who are able to sneak out, you are simply one shock away. One missed train, one child getting sick, you miss a couple hours on your shift, and you're right back in. Understanding what that does, not just physically, but also what that does psychologically on a person and what that does psychologically on a family. And so we then organizationally went through our own intellectual audit process to really think hard about what would it mean to actually not just fight this problem, but be able to put together the building blocks that are actually moving people out of poverty sustainably. So singular shocks, singular issues will not simply push a person or an individual or a family or a household right back into poverty. How do we think about actually lifting New York City families out of household, uh, New York City households out of poverty measurably and sustainably? That became our mission. Because the truth is, if we really want to pull the curtain up, if someone were to ask me the question and say, you know, how much has Robin Hood given towards this fight over the past 10 years, I could tell you to the dollar. But if someone changes the question and says, how many families have been sustainably moved out of poverty during the same period, the truth is, I cannot give you an answer. This forced us to get sharper. This forced us to get more critical. This forced us to get more analytical because the truth is, when that's the question that's being asked, this is not arbitrage. We don't win no matter what. How do we think about those elements that are actually helping to lift families out of poverty measurably and sustainably? And then also, how do we think about the things that are putting them there in the first place? and attacking those. That not just thinking about the downstream, but really aggressively going after the upstream. And so what exactly does that mean for us and the world of philanthropy? It means knowing that we have to then take and sharpen our analysis and our grant making that is really going to focus on this idea of sustainable economic mobility. Focus on those things that are giving everyone throughout the entire life cycle, the entire life cycle journey, from as early as when a child is in embryo 
to when that child is hitting third grade and then we're now starting to get actual indicators and measurements, whether or not that child is going to be reading by grade level and all the other parameters that then exist around that and what that means. To think about the high school graduation rate, but not simply the high school graduation rate, but making sure the high school graduation rate actually means something. Then more kids that actually walk across the graduation stage are actually then prepared for college and careers. To think about whether that child or whether that young adult, whether they happen to walk across the graduation stage or not, that they are somehow prepared to be able to contribute to the larger economic growth and our larger economic output that we would hope for and expect. To making sure that individuals, if they happen to be currently working in occupations that we know are going to be challenged and contracted over the next years, that we can come up with new and creative ways of retraining and supporting and making sure we can do all of that while at the same time not having a basic conflagration of basic social services that people rely on. How do we make sure that we can think about our grant making in a centered way to truly focus on this idea of is this creating the building blocks and the measurements that are leading to sustainable mobility which we will count and measure and track? But it's also understanding from a philanthropic perspective that our grant making is not enough. The money that we can give, the checks that we can write, even the management assistance and support that we can give to our community partners, many of whom are in this room. That's not going to be enough to address the problem that we're facing. I've got a quote on my desk uh, and it's a quote from Dr. King. And the quote says, philanthropy is admirable, but the philanthropist can never forget the social, the social injustice that makes philanthropy necessary. Philanthropy is admirable, but the philanthropist can never forget the social injustice that makes philanthropy necessary. We're dealing in a specter of social injustice. We're dealing in a specter of economic injustice. And so how then can we use influence and voice to be able to attack that as well? Because what's happening right now in this field and what's happening right now in this space is each and every one of us are being asked to question our job descriptions. Each and every one of us in the seats that we sit in, in the roles that we take on, in the organizations that we represent, each and every one of us are being asked, what else can you do? Because that's what the field demands. And so that it will be about the philanthropic grants that we will make, but also it will be about how do we think differently, more creatively, and more aggressively about the partnerships that we can forge. How do we go and think big about who it is that we can work with on other unique innovations that can actually fundamentally address the problem that we're all trying to solve? How do we think about using our voice in new and creative ways, using our data in new and creative and, and, and useful ways? Because whether we're talking about the poverty tracker, whether we're talking about collections of other research that we will pull together, none of us are doing this to put this out in a vacuum. None of us are doing this to simply say we have put out X reports a year and think that's going to be enough. How are we being resourceful to make sure that they're getting in the hands of people who actually can then change their practices and patterns to be able to shift the dynamics that exist? How are we being honest and courageous about incorporating things into this conversation that fundamentally matter, issues such as race. Because we're never having an honest conversation about poverty unless we're also being honest about the role that race and sex and sexual orientation play into this. 
We could talk about the larger poverty rate in New York City all we want. We could talk about the fact that 19% of New Yorkers are currently in poverty, but let's also be honest that if you're talking about the Latinx population, that number hovers around 25%. And we have to ask why. We have to be honest, and when we talk about things like maternal mortality, the fact that black women in this city are eight times more likely to die in childbirth. The same numbers that are equivalent to a woman who's giving birth in Syria and Iraq. Talk about the fact that for an African American woman who graduates from college, that her economic probability for success hovers around the same measurement of a white male high school dropout. How do we also talk about this conversation that it's not even just about a black-white issue? How do we also understand the fact that over the past two years, the number of Asians living in poverty has jumped by 44% in the city? That currently for Asians living in poverty, we have about a quarter of a million people. And by the way, the measurement, the number of government social services that go, will go specifically towards populations and organizations that are supporting that population hovers around 1.3%. Being honest about what the data is telling us and then being able to have those conversations and put the focus where it needs to be. Being honest about the role that advocacy plays and being honest about the role that policy plays. We're not in the situation that we're in right now because philanthropy hasn't done its job. We're not in the situation that we're in right now because social service organizations and universities and social workers haven't done theirs. We're in the situation we are in right now because we are still living in a condition of economic inequality where policies are helping to make it so. How then are we going to use our voice and our advocacy to be able to address the policies that exist that are still putting people and keeping people in poverty? So organizationally, we have a focus on addressing policy. In fact, for the first time in the history of the organization, we actually now have a chief public policy officer who I'm excited to say is here right now as well. And when we're talking about policy, we're talking really about three different elements, right? One is the policies in place. Two is thinking about the regulations that are currently in place that we have to fix. And three, the policies we need to defend against, the potentials, the things being discussed, that we should have a very clear opinion as to whether or not they are going to make any of us better. So when we're talking about things like the policies in place, we know that there are certain things that philanthropy can build upon, certain things that philanthropy can do that can help to address the, tra the trauma and the pain that people are existing, but we also know that there are still structural challenges that will take place in the life of that person or in the life of that household if we are not honest and if we're not strong enough to address it. You take one example of just being the criminal justice system. We can fund the best job training programs in the world, and actually I would argue that we do. We fund job training programs that quantitatively and qualitatively give people skill sets, give people confidence, change psychologies, that give people, even when they're returning home, put them on a better pathway and a higher probability of long-term economic success for them and their family. In fact, one of the, uh, one of the first community partner visits that I did when I, uh, when I came to Robin Hood was we went to spend the day at Rikers Island, and I still say to this day that it was one of the most powerful visits that we've had, that I've had, where you see good work 
and the work of organizations such as the Fortune Society and the work that Single Stop was doing, et cetera, where you felt really good and felt really empowered that good work was happening. And at the same time, it was a place where I have never felt weaker. Because it's not enough. Because you could give a person a fantastic job training program. And when they come home, if we basically say to them, we're like, you know, welcome home. But by the way, you can't live in public housing. And even if your family's there, they then need to make a choice. Welcome home, but remember, there are certain jobs that you still don't qualify for. Federal jobs, state jobs, private jobs, and for many of them, you can apply for those jobs. But remember, you gotta check boxes. Understanding the fact and completely knowledgeable the fact that 75% of people who have to check boxes will not complete the application because psychologically they've already been eliminated from the process. Well, maybe we can try higher education. That's great, but remember, we've decided to have, frankly, a completely backwards policy about the usage of things like Pell Grants inside of institutions, but even if you make it past that, let's say we talk about higher education, that's fine. But remember, even if you apply for many places of higher education, you have to check boxes for that as well. And many federal and state grants, you don't qualify for. So basically, we have created this dynamic that every sentence becomes a life sentence. Every sentence we are dealing and people are dealing with the implications of past decisions and past injustices. And they will deal with them for the rest of their lives. Philanthropy can do but so much to address that. These are policies. And our job as both philanthropic organization, our job as data scientists, is to make sure we're being very honest and very clear about what is the role of other frameworks and other institutions to be able to address the structural problems that exist. We talk about current policies and regulations that we have to fix. Robinhood has over 250 community partners and one of the things that we did when we first came on board, myself, our COO, who's, who's here today as well, and our chief program officer, then had meetings and breakfast and gatherings with every single one of our community partners. Over 250 organizations, over 250 leaders of these organizations. And there was a theme that started to come up. And this theme that started to come up was almost regardless of size of the community partner, almost regardless of the tenure, how long they had been involved with Robinhood, almost regardless of what they focused on and what they did, how many of them were still waiting on money from the city? I, it, was, it was almost like clockwork. Where you start asking questions and you're starting to say, listen, you know, what, what kind of things are you guys focusing on? What things, are, what things are, are, are most taking up your time and attention? And what was amazing was how many of them are basically saying, I am still waiting on a receivable. And we started to realize how much bigger of a problem that this was not just a, this was not just a gripe. That when we're talking about city receivables, we have organizations that, can, that are literally waiting up to six to nine months and the total number hovers around three quarters of a billion dollars. Organizations that have budget shortfalls in the millions. And to think that doesn't affect your operational flow, to think that doesn't affect how many people you can serve or how you serve them, to think that doesn't affect even your philanthropic relationship because the truth is, and I think about our work here at Robinhood, where we, we, we try to be very tight about, and, and have very strict guardrails over how money is used and all that kind of stuff. For those who are part of the Robinhood family, you probably know all too well. 
But the reality is capital is fungible. The reality is the executive directors and the leaders of our respective organizations, if I know that I am still waiting on a check for X and I've got to make sure my people get paid, I'm going to find whatever pot's available. Regulations that are currently still in place that we know that we still have to adapt and adjust. Because so much pressure, so much weight, so much of our social fabric is being placed on the shoulders of many of you. And many of our social organizations out here are nonprofits, our 501c3s, who are carrying down on everything from job training programs to housing programs to food and can never put together a sustainable operational model because we as a city unit and we have a city, as a city structure haven't been able to keep pace with the work that's being done to serve many of our most vulnerable citizens. And then thinking about how do we keep certain policies from happening in the first place. For many of you, I'm sure you're uh, familiar with uh, what's taking place right now with the proposal to have the in in adjustments on the inflation indexes. So, uh, and what that basically means, it's looking at adjusting who is in poverty. Not really looking at adjusting what's going on or how to adjust the problem. It's just adjusting who is in poverty. And when you're looking at lowering the inflation index, essentially what you're talking about is you're increasing the benchmarks and lowering the amount of people who will then qualify for specific benefits. Right? There was, uh, there was one school in particular uh, that, uh, that I was looking at. And um, if it weren't so serious, you, you couldn't help but laugh at how absurd it is. This school currently exists where, you know, for the population of the school, it's about 90% 90, 90 poverty rate in the school. If these proposals that are put in place actually go into, into effect, the poverty rate in that school will overnight turn into 35%. I wish I could tell you it's because that percentage of people, their lives actually got better. I wish I could tell you that. The truth is that's not what it means. It just simply means by adjusting, adjusting the inflation index, we're then continuing to rewrite the line as to who is poor, who gets support, who's living in poverty, and why and what we as a large society, what is our obligation to be able to serve? By the way, that one school that I was talking about, the one that went from 90 to 35 percent, they're talking about just on that individual school basis, talking about now having a lowering of $250,000 in everything from teacher loan commitments and other grants. When we talk about things like the poverty line, First of all, let's be clear, we're talking about a relatively arbitrary line. We're talking about a relatively arbitrary line that was crafted generations ago. And by the way, when you're talking about things that actually impact many New Yorkers, things like housing, that's not incorporated into that. But we make this larger judgment that once a person, because the poverty line hovers around $24,700, but let's say a person's now at $25,000 for a family of four, that they're now good. That's our judgment. And the truth is, is that if, if you ask, uh, if you ask my opinion, you ask the opinion of, of many of us in this room and our Robin team, there do need to be adjustments. And actually, we need to be more generous and more considerate about what it is to be struggling and what it is for people who are actually living in poverty and what that looks like. Thinking about things like, what's the difference between the federal poverty line and the supplemental poverty measure? That actually does incorporate and factor in all those other elements that people have to deal with in their life. 
And how do we use that data and how do we use those measurements to factor in to the larger conversations that are taking place about who it is that we are going to support and why? So this evolution on our part is a very intentional process. A very intentional process to understand that the core question that we should be asking ourselves, all of us, is not just what we have done to attack the problem, but what have we done to keep the problem from being one in the first place and how do we use every asset every tool, every weapon that we have to be able to adjust this. You know, I, I, um, I spent much of, my, much of my childhood in Baltimore and in the Bronx. And I first came up to the Bronx when I was about six years old because a couple years before that, my father died. And my mother decided that she wanted to move us up here to come live with my grandparents. And my grandfather was a minister in the South Bronx, and my grandmother was a school teacher in the South Bronx for 29 years. And oftentimes, you know, when I tell, uh, tell my story, uh, there's a certain element of it that actually it grates me. And what I mean by that is this, is that oftentimes people will hear then, well, yes, then they moved up to the Bronx and then I got in quite a few issues up here. Um, I went to different schools. It was because the schools that I went to before didn't think I should stay. By the time I was 13, I was sent away to a military school in Pennsylvania. By the time I was 11 years old, I first felt handcuffs on my wrist right up on Gun Hill Road in the Bronx. And oftentimes people will talk about this as, isn't it great that he got sent away? Isn't it great that he had a really strong mom and grandparents who could step in? And all that's right. But I'm going to be very honest with you. What happened to me wasn't the fact that I got picked up and moved around. What happened to me wasn't the fact that I was physically transported. I have a mother who I adore with everything in me. You know, I always say, I think uh, my little sister said that uh, we wore, of that my mother wore sweaters so we could wear coats. This is a woman who sacrificed everything for her children. But I also know the difference between me and other young black boys who are coming up in the Bronx or Brooklyn or Queens or Baltimore or Memphis or Liberty City was not just that singular person or that singular thing. It was systems, it was structures. What happened to me wasn't the fact that I got picked up and moved around. It wasn't being physically transported. It was the fact that I found myself surrounded by people. Starting with my mom and my grandparents, but eventually leading to mentors and teachers and guidance counselors and ministers and frankly people who I've never met before in my life but people who woke up every morning with the hope of me. Who are willing to make a way. And who are willing to give me the benefit of the doubt and to help me to understand that if I was willing to work they would work just as hard. People who help me to understand that there was never going to be any accidents of my, my birth, not being black or growing up poor or being from Baltimore or the Bronx or fatherless, fatherless that was ever going to define me, that was ever going to limit me. And so in essence, what they did was they taught me what it meant to be free. That's the point of our work. 
It's freedom. We want to use our analysis and use our data to be able to underline freedom. To be able to underline the fact that people should be able to have dreams and know that their dreams will not be laughed at or be punchlines or be unattainable. The fact that we want people to know that they can and should be comfortable in their own skin. The fact that we want people to know that there is never a room that they don't belong in. At every room that they are in, they are there because they belong there. And they are there because that room would be incomplete if they were not there. Last night we had a graduation ceremony of a young man who we met over at Robin Hood and we met him years ago, he was a Robin Hood hero, in 2015. His name's Demetrius. We met Demetrius through a program called Lawyers for Children because by the time that Robin Hood got to know Demetrius, Demetrius was now working on his 30th foster home. And we got a chance to learn a little bit more about Demetrius' story how many various touch points that Demetrius had. And now here in 2015, we meet this young man who abused, physically, emotionally, sexually abused. A young man with so much hope and so much promise, but frankly, who had been told by so many people about what his destiny was going to be before he even had a chance to define it himself. And last night, a bunch of us had a chance to watch him graduate from NYU. Literally had a rooftop party where from the rooftop, up here in Harlem, from the rooftop that he's living in, he can see the hospital that he was born in. And one of the things we said to Demetrius last night was, Demetrius, you might have been born there, but just look out and everything is yours. Everywhere you look and beyond, it's yours. Now the thing about Demetrius is, Demetrius looks in that and Demetrius heard that. And Demetrius believes it now. Our job is to make sure that it's not just about creating more Demetriuses, but making sure stories like his don't have to be so exceptional. And so when we say things like freedom, that we can be telling the truth, that this can be real. The research matters because this is where we have to go. Social policy matters because it'll be driven by both the heart and the mind. And letting people know who we're going to fight for and why. Now, I'll, I'll close real quick before I open up the questions. Um, so Erwin was talking about the, uh, the book that I wrote before I got to Robin Hood uh, called The Other West Moore. And, um, I'll tell you all a quick story, and it's always very, by the way, it's very intimidating being in front of a room of, of like really smart people, <laughs> academics, because all y'all have written like multiple books and multiple reports and all this kind of stuff. That was my first book. I wasn't really into this, you know, I didn't know this process at all. And I remember when I first got contacted, they said, you know, I was gonna get a book deal. I was so excited about it that I didn't read the contract fully. Always read contracts. Um, but I didn't read the contract fully because it was really long. And, and but finally, I, I got, I was like, where do I sign the, like, the last page? I was like, great. So I signed the last page. Um, had I read through the contract fully, I would have understood something. I would have understood that everything you see on the inside of books, right, the words, the content, the structure, all that kind of stuff, all that is what the author wants to share with the world. It's the author's words, it's the author's ideas, author's intent, right? Everything you see on the outside of books, the cover, the title, 
the airbrushed author photos, the blurbs, all that, right? All that, all that is what the publisher wants to share with the world. The publisher holds on to those rights for a reason. They hold on to those rights for a reason because they know that is their only chance to market to you as the consumer. They will do whatever it takes to market to you as the consumer to make it look interesting that you might actually pick up the book and actually go buy it, right? So they call me up, they're like, Wes, we'd like to have a conversation with you about the title of your book. I thought conversation meant the English definition of the word conversation. <laughs> like we would exchange ideas back and forth. I had no idea this is the conversation they were gonna tell me what the new title of my book was gonna be. So I go and I sit down. They're all sitting around a table. They're talking to me. And I kind of cut them off. And I said, listen, I'm so happy we're having this conversation. And I'm like, because I've thought about it. And there's like six titles that I really like. And they said, what are they? And I started rattling them off. I was like, Baltimore Suns, All the Difference, Out of Many, End of the Innocence, Life After Death. And I had reasons for all these titles, right? And I looked at them and I said, so y'all can go ahead and choose between any of those six titles. <laughs> because I'm good with any of them, right? And they kind of looked at each other and they looked at me and they said, that's, that's very kind of you. Um, and they said, we think we have a better idea. And they said, what do you think about the other Wes Moore? And I looked at them and I said, I think that's the dumbest book title that I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> this is a true story. And they were like, what don't you like about it? And I was like, there's a whole bunch of things I like about it. I said, but let me go ahead and start with three. First thing I told him I like about it, I was like, I wanted to make it clear this story wasn't just about these two kids. So by putting the name inside of the title of the book, are you not completely negating that entire fact? Right? That's one. Second thing I told him I like about it. <laughs> what self-respected author do you know that puts their own name inside of a title of a book that they have written? Right? The other James Baldwin, the other J.K. Rowling, the other Stephen King. Um, and the third thing I told him I like about it, I was like, listen, guys, no one knows who one Westmore is. So why does anyone care who the other Westmore is? And so when I said that to them, they looked at me and they smiled, and they were like, those are actually all really good points. <laughs> and they said, the problem is you're missing the point. Because it's not about you. And it's not about him. The name is completely irrelevant. You can throw any name inside of that book title. It does not matter. Because the truth is, there are Westmores that exist in every one of our communities. Every one of our neighborhoods, every one of our homes. People who are either one decision away or one policy decision away from going in one direction or going in a completely different direction. People who every day are straddling this line of greatness and the problem is they don't even know it. The most important thing about the title is not the name. The most important thing about the title is the other. And the fact that our society is full of others. People who might come from different family lineages. People who might look differently or speak differently. People who might come from a different part of the country or a different part of the world. People who might call their God a different name. People whose destiny matters as much to the long term greatness and opportunity and safety and security of our communities as ours does. The others. People who every day, we don't need to remind them about the trauma of poverty. They feel it. People who every day, we don't need to remind what it means to be on the cusp. They live it. We fight for them. We will always fight for them. And we will always make sure that we are leading and being creative and innovative in the tools that we have at our disposal to make sure we're creating a more just and a more equitable, a more fair and a more God-honoring society. That's our mission. And we're thankful to be able to work with you all 
in that every single day. Bless you guys, and thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I see the microphone's coming. So uh, if anybody has any, any, any thoughts or comments or, or, or questions, I, uh, I would love to. And I know uh, if I don't know the answer, I know there are plenty of smart people in this Robin Hood team or surround me all over who do. So, uh, uh. Hi. Hi. Um, thank you. That was a really rousing speech, and it was touching. Thank you. Thank you. I was wondering, just when you were talking about the other, if you happen to have seen Jordan Peele's Us, and I guess, did that resonate with you? I think it's funny that he uses horror and comedy as a genre to look at race and class and society because it kind of, maybe horror is, maybe he's like onto something with that. But I was wondering if that movie resonated with you. Hugely, I'm a huge Jordan Peele fan. By the way, has, has everyone uh, here seen, uh, seen us? No? Oh my goodness, homework assignment for this weekend, y'all. Um, it really is an, an, an extraordinary, uh, an, it's an extraordinary film and, and without doing any, for all the people who are shaking their heads this way, uh, without doing any spoiler um, alerts, uh, it is a very powerful, entertaining, but powerful examination of, of um, how do I say this without giving it away, almost like the, uh, the mirror images of who we are and how we treat those who are actually a thin line away from us. Um, is that enough without giving it away? Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I thought, and it's, 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 it's double gangers, right? And, and, it's think, and it's thinking about, the thing I thought was really powerful about it, uh, and again, in, in Jordan Peele's fascinating and, and, and entertaining way, was we as a large society have a very, have a very frequent and, uh, and very unnerving tendency to either congratulate or castigate without really knowing much about any of it. Right? We're very quick to either celebrate the successes and condemn the failures without having any idea about what actually got us to that point. And not, without being willing to examine it. And, and, and I think part of it, is, part of it comes from selfishness, right? Because it just helps us get to bed at night better. Because I think for all of us as a large society, if we actually had to deal with that weight and, 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 and rest with that weight all the time, it's pretty heavy. If our large society were to be completely honest about the weight of the inequality and fraud that has existed, it's hard. And I think one of the things that Jordan Peele did that was so that was so beautiful was, you know, you found yourself almost at the end of this at the end of this movie, uh, almost wrestling with the dynamic and the dichotomy of it, where you almost find yourself, and again, no spoilers, but almost find yourself like wondering, who am I rooting for right now? Like, I don't even know which one is which. And I thought there was a real beauty, and there was a real beauty and there was a real power to that. Because essentially when it comes down to it, the level of connection and the level of closeness that all of us have as a large society is real. We oftentimes are the ones to create that separation. You know, something I, I, I believe in deeply, and I had, uh, my, uh, my minister actually said this to me once when he was like, and it's, it's a great phrase where he says, you know, if we're all God's children, then by definition, we're brothers and sisters. If we're all God's children, then by definition, we're all brothers and sisters. So essentially what he was saying, we should start acting like that. Right? Acting like we have that level of closeness. And understanding why, when we make that larger decision to do that separation and that push, um, why we have to understand the anger and the disillusionment that is then created from that, why that is so real. Because that's, in essence, what we're talking about in a larger part of society. Uh, you, know, you know, Sarah, a member, member of our team, um, you know, Brilliantly, in fact, one of the things we, we, t we looked at through the, through the poverty tracker was this level of hopefulness, right? Where is society emotionally? Where are we psychologically? And particularly when you're looking at an understanding from the 4,000 households that we then follow with the poverty tracker. And, you know, and, and again, and, and Sarah br brilliantly talks about this, this idea of understanding what does it mean to understand how levels of disillusionment and frustration play into all of this work? 
Because the truth is, is that if we're talking about a society and we're talking about a community that is heavily disillusioned, you really need to think about whether any of your programs are going to work because the levels of skepticism immediately already will overpower. So what are the first things that we have to do to build up that level of connection and build up that level of trust? And so one of the things that I think, I think that Jordan Peele just did an absolutely brilliant job of, of kind of showing what happens when that separation exists, what happens when that disillusionment is allowed to grow, and how in many ways the scariest thing that we all will face is basically the byproduct of what we have created. And that's why I thought it was so um, terrifying, but also brilliant in the way that he pulled it off. He, he really, he's a, I mean, he's a, he's a magic filmmaker. He's a magic filmmaker. If y'all haven't seen it, that's a homework assignment. Go check it out. Hi, thank you so much. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm hey, a right. MSWMPH candidate here. And I really I appreciated you bringing up this idea that you know philanthropy and sort of private work is never going to be enough. It's never going to solve the problem, right? What do you see as kind of practical steps that private organizations like Robinhood, like a university, et cetera, can do to advocate and, and work towards more systemic policy changes like you were talking about? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and by the way, thank you for your work, and, uh, and congratulations and good luck. Um, I think there's a lot of things organizationally that philanthropy and our organizations can do, one of which is that we have the chance to be catalytic capital, right? We have the chance to take, pun take punts, make bets, go where the data leads us in order to do things that, frankly, it might be too early or it might still be too risky for government to be able to do, but then we can go out and do it knowing that the level, that the, that the risk appetite for our organizations might be a little bit higher, right? And so, and, and you, you look at, you know, and Robinhood has, has both classic historic examples of how that's been done and also classic current examples about how that's, how that's being done. You know, a historic example that oftentimes is, uh, is, is talked about and referred to was the fact that Robinhood was the first one to invest in things like, in things like needle exchanges. And the reason that Robinhood invested in needle exchanges was because, again, the data was showing us that as we're having this rapid rise in HIV in, in HIV AIDS, what are some we the data was showing us that maybe needle exchanges could be something that can actually could curb that trend and actually stem that tide. And so Robin had invested in it. And now if you look at our portfolio, we Robin doesn't invest in needle exchanges. Nobody does. The federal government does it. Right? But they were never going to be the first money in. They needed us, our organizations, to be able to put things in place to be able to show how that actually works. And again, you know, current examples of looking at everything from, you know, from uh, NYC, NYC Cares, how NYC Cares right now really came from a 2005 grant of Robin and other organizations that, to, that peers together to create this, this platform called Action Health NYC. Basically saying that we just think that coverage should be a universal phenomenon and a universal reality regardless of documentation status. Looking at things like the Immigrant Justice Corps is basically saying that we believe in the right of legal representation for people regardless of your documentation status. So the, these, are, these are platforms that I think philanthropy can play a really important role in, is that we can be risk capital. We can come up with the data, we can come up with the analysis, we can come up with the things that eventually we know that our job is not for our capital to be, you know, we want our capital to be patient. We don't want our capital to be permanent. We want to invest in things that we know that eventually the goal is that it's going to be taken over. It's going to go public, right? And it can happen in a mechanism once you can, prevent, once you can present enough data, enough metrics, enough of a platform to show some of your larger partners, i.e. the city, the state, the federal government, et cetera, show them that it's okay, the water's warm. We've tested these things out. We believe in not just its, its morality, but we believe in its efficacy. And once you can combine those two things, you now have something really interesting and again, potentially catalytic. So those are the type of things that I think philanthropy and social organizations have a unique role to play when it comes to how we think about usages of capital and how it can be then grown and scaled. Thank you. 
Mr. Moore, I'm representing 60 people who are watching this via live stream. And I have a question from Tanzilia. She'd okay. like to know how does Robin Hood Foundation involve people who have direct experience in poverty as equal contributors in its programs? Do they have a seat at the table and do they participate meaningfully as co-researchers? Thank you. I love that question. I love that question. Um, and you know, it's, it's something that I think, uh, you know, if I'm just being uh, completely honest and completely frank, and this is not just a Robin Hood thing, I think this is a larger philanthropy social services thing where we all have to recenter and get back to the roots of understanding the fact that, it, you know, as we say, the people who are, uh, who are you know, nearest to the challenges ha are going to be nearest to the solutions and also must then have a seat at the table. Uh, how do you then involve community voice, and not just in a ceremonial way, but involve community voice in a very practical way, knowing that the decisions that you are making are decisions that are informed and accountable to the most accountable of them all, which is the community that you are hoping to work with and serve. You know, I think about the work that, uh, that Robin Hood does right now, uh, where we have a, a tech incubator inside of Brooklyn called Blue Ridge Labs. And Blue Ridge Labs, it's, 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 it's actually fascinating because it's, it's really kind of a building that's a combination of computer engineers and community organizers who all kind of rally in the same space and are really working in unison, working hand in hand to be able to create, address, and solve some of the biggest challenges that are existing for the community members that are actively a part of that process. To make that happen, we have a, 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 a we have a, a, a group of platform part of Blue Ridge Labs called the Design Insight Group. What the Design Insight Group essentially, fundamentally, is it's 1,100 New Yorkers who are currently living in poverty. They are paid. They are part of our team, and they are involved in every single aspect of the decision making process. And so, for example. When, you know, when we had a, had a solution uh, that was being, that was being uh, pulled together uh, called Propel by a, guy named, uh, by a guy named Jimmy who actually started something called, he started Facebook groups. Um, he made Facebook groups money uh, and then decided that he wanted to spend some time working on social issues. So he joined Blue Ridge Labs. And the thing that really became fascinating to him was how social benefits were being used and utilized. And again, this actually goes back to the comment that I was making earlier about how we think about basic things of social benefits, whether it's SNAP, WIC, food stamps, et cetera. How, when we talk about how we need to raise the bar for qualification, the truth is, is that as currently standing, the average household who's receiving forms of benefit by the, t forms of benefits, by the 21st day of the month, they will run out on average. So the question, so again, so I, Quick side note, then I'll come back. So another reason why the whole conversation about, well, our benefits package is too generous is, is it's laughable if it wasn't so serious. And it's not, it's, not, it's not rooted in data. Back to Jimmy. That's the issue that Jimmy said he wanted to focus on. And so as Jimmy is going and doing his analysis and working with families, he then starts realizing as he's talking with families and talking with the Design Insight Group, et cetera, he realized that most people all had specific elements, and they had cell phones. And so he's like, I can use technology to be able to help solve this problem. He creates this platform called Fresh EBT. And what Fresh EBT basically does, it's a, it's a, it's a technology, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a downloadable software where individuals can actually better manage their public benefits, help them last longer, find out where discounts are, help them to eat better, during the federal government shutdown, Fresh EBT was one of the highest downloaded financial support apps on the Apple App Store. We think about things like, uh, we think about things like this platform at Blue Ridge Labs called Good Call. And Good Call looks at and examines the reality that on average every year in New York, about 300,000 people are arrested. Of those people who are arrested, about 1% have legal representation at time of arrest. And so what then happens? A person goes in, 
They're there in question. They do not know what's going on. They have their cell phone, their wallets, everything taken from them. For people, if your first phone call, that phone call that you have, if that phone call is not made to either an attorney or a family member who can put you in touch with legal representation, that person's chances of conviction have just risen by 75%. And we all know the stories about what happens when you have people who then the whole bail issue, people sitting in sitting in, in jails, and frankly, the only way they know they're going to get out unless they can figure out a way of putting up the 600, 800, 1500, 4000 dollars for bail is to basically take a plea. And when you consider the reality that currently right now about 45 percent of New Yorkers cannot afford a 40 a 400 dollar shock. 45 percent of New Yorkers cannot afford a 400 dollar shock. Right? And so you have people who will then make a choice. They'll either sit and wait for their day in court, probably losing jobs, or they can take pleas. So Good Call created basically it's a hotline. Using technology and created a hotline that a person at the point of arrest can make a singular phone call, and that singular phone call does two things. One. It lets your family know where you are, because oftentimes you will have people who will go days and their family has no idea even where they are. The second thing it does, it puts you in touch with a, with a public defender. They've now gotten the technology that it has worked down to where it, from the time, from the point of call to when you're in touch with a public defender, that time is now down to 38 seconds. What does it mean when you now have a public defender? It means you now have a lawyer. It means the questioning stops. It means they work through your counsel. So whether it is Jelani and Gabe with Good Call or whether it was Jimmy with Fresh EBT, none of the solutions could have been created had it not been for community input and community voice. Jelani and Gabe and, and, and Jimmy did not get that from white papers. They didn't get that from annual reports. They didn't get that from from White House press briefings. <laughs> they got it from the community. And so it's not just a, a, a focus of, of how we think about the work. Truthfully, it's going to be a heavily increased way that we think about how are we deriving and funding and finding and building solutions to some of these chronic challenges that exist that eventually, again, we can be that catalytic capital that can help to solve these problems in a very structural and a very deliberate way. Thank you. Um, I'm being inaudibly screamed at in the back. I think I've gone too long, and I'm keeping you off from your panel. Um, but, but again, I just want to say sincerely and deeply thank you. Thank you for your work. Thank you for your focus on these issues. And, uh, and, and thank you for fighting for the others because it matters. So bless you guys. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sarah Oltmans, and I'm the Managing Director of Health at Robinhood. Um, and as part of my job, I have the pleasure of working with this amazing team from Columbia on our Poverty Tracker project. Um, you've already heard a little bit about it from Wes, and you'll hear more from the Columbia team in a minute. But basically, as a bit of background, this was a project we started in 2012 with this concept, just what Wes was talking about, to not just look at this arbitrary poverty line, but to really get a more detailed and nuanced view of what poverty means. So we go about this in a couple of different ways um, when working with the Poverty Tracker. So first, we don't just look at income poverty. We don't just look at that arbitrary line. We also look at health issues, and we look at material hardships, like running out of food at the end of the month. Um, we know that even if you're above that poverty line, but you're getting evicted from your apartment, you're not really at a point where we can say that you're sustainably out of poverty. 
Um, so now we're about seven years into this project and um, we're just at this really exciting point. We have a really detailed set of data um, and we're just finding new insights and spending time looking into this data um, to get more insights into how we do our work and hopefully to affect how the city and the state does their work as well. Um, so you're going to hear more from the Columbia team about the analysis that we've been doing this year. Um, but what I'm really excited about, uh, the different topics that they're touching on is, I think they really show some of the diversity of things that we've been looking at and shows really the richness um, of the research that we have um, and the, the fact that we were able to fa follow families year over year to see what's really happening in their lives. So the way this is really set up, we're going to just go through and do kind of a lightning round of presentations and we'll take some questions from the audience. And to kick things off, we have Chris Weimer, who is the co-director of the Center on Poverty and Social Policy, who's going to just touch on some of the key findings from our annual report on poverty and disadvantage. Um, so yeah, so first thank you to Wes and thank you to Sarah, um, you know, both for, for their participation today and the, the, the amazing speech, but also the, the general partnership that we've developed since uh, even before 2012, I think. 2012 when we launched in the field, but I think there's some uh, discussions and planning before that. So uh, as Sarah mentioned, we're going to do kind of a lightning round. The one exception that is my presentation, which might be a little longer because I'm going to talk about some of the, and that's not just because of my ego and, you know, <laughs> the love of my own voice, but because um, I, I want to talk sort of about the core uh, poverty and, and, and hardship measures in the study. And then the lightning round, Lily and Chloe and Sophie will sort of talk about um, some, of the, some of the offshoot analyses that we've done because in addition to being a study of poverty and inequality in, in New York City, um, it's also a nimble tool where we are able to add questions very quickly that come up either um, because of public events or because of um, you know, interest from policymakers or from Robin Hood or program operators, et cetera. Um, and so we're going to show some of the cool results that, that emerge from some of the data that we collect along the way. Um, but as Sarah was mentioning, the Poverty Tracker uh, is a quarterly survey uh, that we've been doing since 2012. So we recruited about 2,000 families um, in 2012 and followed them by surveying quarterly over a two-year period. Um, so by early 2015, we stopped following that first sample, and then in 2015, we partnered with the Department of Health in the city to recruit 4,000 families, um, which we've actually been surveying for about four years now. Um, and we will continue to recruit sort of new panel members every couple of years um, to, to ensure that the, the sample stays representative of the city. Um, I should mention, it's not a sample, it's not a sample of the poor population um, or, or the low-income population. It's really a representative sample of all adults in New York City. Um, and so we can take the temperature of uh, poverty and other measures of well-being. So we have these core measures that we ask about every year. One is income poverty. Um, here we use this improved measure of income poverty called the supplemental poverty measure, which Wes mentioned briefly. Um, the, the, the key thing that that does is it, it accounts for the higher cost of housing in New York City. So you actually have a higher poverty line than that 24700 um, that Wes was mentioning. It's not drastically higher, it's around 32000 but it, it takes into account um, some of those higher costs. It also captures a, a broader definition of resources, including not just cash income, but income from tax credits and SNAP and uh, other in-kind supports. Um, and then we go beyond income poverty though, right? So um, we look at these material hardships which are direct measures of people's uh, consumption really um, or problems financing their consumption. So it'd be uh, food insecurity, um, people having trouble paying their rent, paying their bills, uh, inability to see a doctor or medical professional um, because of their costs. And then we look at non-economic things. So we look at health problems. So here we're looking at people who are in poor health or have a work limiting uh, disability. Um, so as I said, we've been in the field about six years. Um, we're in the field all the time. You'll notice um, a lot of the people who are helping at the desk and Angie and Abe who are helping with the microphones, all these people we peeled away from their desks today to come help us and they all touch Robin Hood in one, in one um, the Robin Hood project in, in one facet or another. Um, and thank you all, by the way. <laughs> um, and then we can also look at the combination of, of these, these multiple disadvantages. Um, 
And the, the goal really is to see what kind of progress we're making in the fight against poverty. So sometimes our question is related to how our program service operators doing, how, sometimes it's how well our policy is doing in reducing poverty, what are the long-term trends and what are the trends in those dynamics, right? So we're not just looking at repeated snapshots, um, we're, look, we're able to look at how people fare over time. Um, that said, we are able to track just overall trends in poverty and other forms of disadvantage over time. So the, we, we started releasing in the fall, I think, <laughs> our first annual report, and then we'll, we'll release a, an annual report in the fall uh, every year in the future. So these are just some of the latest results from our first annual report. As you can see, poverty is coming down in the city, so that light blue line is from our poverty tracker, and it's looking at adult poverty rates in New York City. So that has come down since 2012 from about 23% to 18%, and that tracks largely um, with data from other large cities. Uh, and sort of the national, the national rate actually has come down uh, slightly less than the New York City poverty rate, so there's been some convergence there. But again, none of this is surprising. You can get this kind of statistic from the, you know, from the mayor's office or from census data. Um, where we offer new insight uh, is, is being able to go beyond just a simple measure of income poverty. And as I mentioned, we have these different types of hardships that we track. And you can see that those have come down too, although again, modestly. So one thing to note from this is that the, the rate of what we call material hardship is uh, higher than the rate of income poverty. So over a third, or actually just a third in 2017, uh, experienced a material hardship in the past 12 months across those five different domains. But that has come down modestly a little bit too, from 37% to 33%. Um, Interestingly, it's not just the poor who suffer from material hardship. Uh, material hardship actually extends fairly far up the income distribution. So this shows the rate of hardship um, by people's income to needs category, so just their resources divided by the poverty line. So about half of the poor and a half of the low income uh, New Yorkers uh, uh, suffer from a hardship. And that does begin to tail off, especially after you hit around 200% of the poverty line. Um, but even up 300, 400%, there's still some, um, some, some evidence of material hardships. And so you might think, why would that be? We, we have a paper that tries to unpack that, but th things that stand out would be like uh, high levels of debt, uh, high levels of uh, medical bills, um, uh, mental health issues, various, you know, there's, there's lots of things that can explain um, why you might have a hardship even with elevated levels of income. And here you just see that, that, of course, material hardship does vary with poverty status. So those in poverty do have higher rates. But like we saw in the other, in the, in the slide previously, by no means is it confined to those in poverty. Um, and you'll notice especially the high levels of medical hardship here. Um, so that's people reporting that they were unable to see a doctor because of the cost specifically. So our third dimension of disadvantage is, is, is health challenges or health problems. And you can see those are more stable over time. Um, really don't vary very much year to year, and that, that's as to be expected. Um, again, health problems do vary by income, uh, and again, tail off at higher levels of income, um, but by no means go away, right? So still 12% in the highest income category uh, report a health problem as, composed, as compared to 26% uh, and 31% of the lowest income New Yorkers. And then we can look across these three measures and see whether people report any form of disadvantage. And again, that's come down a little bit to reflecting the, the mirroring the trends for poverty and material hardship. But what's striking about this is, is over half of New Yorkers suffer from at least one of these three forms of disadvantage. And while that's come down a little, it's still pretty, it's still pretty troublingly high. Um, I don't know what that was, but. Um, so when we aggregate, we can also turn this into, um, when, when the sample is properly weighted, we can calculate the number of actual New Yorkers who suffer from these various disadvantages. Um, so I won't dwell on all the numbers, but you can see um, you know, 1.3 million live in poverty in any given year. 2.8 million adults um, suffer from mater material hardship. I haven't talked a lot about the children's rates um, because in the, in the main poverty tracker sample, about a third of the sample will have kids. Um, so we do a much better job with kids in the, in the larger panel that we started following in 2015. But I should mention there's also this companion project where we have uh, around 1,500, 1,600, I think, um, parents of children zero to two, and they'll get all the same surveys um, that, that, that members of the Poverty Tracker get, plus some additional things focused on child and child care. So I think the, the first report on that is, is written, and it's probably coming out in the fall, I think, again.
and we'll probably uh, do an event around that. So that's exciting. We'll be able to do a much deeper dive on issues facing families with children. Um, so this speaks to the sort of stickiness that Wes was mentioning. So this looks at um, the the rate that the the rate of suffering from different forms of disadvantage across the years of the panel. Um, so you can see that uh, 20 20 percent uh, did not exit poverty um, across two years, um, but 43 percent exited disadvantage for two years following following being in poverty. So sorry, so this, this starts among the people who started in poverty and looks at what happened to them, right? Um, so 20 percent of those that that, sta that started in poverty never exited poverty. Um, a bigger chunk, you know, 37 percent bounce in and out of poverty, as Wes was talking about, and 43 percent sort of sustainably get out. Um, and you can see the rates for hardship and other forms of disadvantage. Um, the other point to make here is that the other forms of dis disadvantage um, do seem to be quote unquote stickier um, than poverty. So half of, half of people who start material hardship don't exit from hardship over the, over the panel. Um, this shows, um, we, we started to get interested in this question alongside Robin Hood and the idea of stably exiting disadvantage, it's sort of related to that point of just getting above this poverty line is not necessarily enough if you're gonna fall right back in it um, you know, a year later. Um, so we are also able to look at trends in stably exiting poverty. Um, and so this just takes the earliest year-to-year -year transition and the latest year-to-year -year transition in our data. And you can see there's this modest growth in the rate of stably exiting poverty or hardship or uh, other types of disadvantage. Um, so 62% in the earliest year to up to 69% in the latest year of the data. So how far do people actually get when they exit poverty? Um, so this slide looks actually at where the, the people who exit from one year to the next get. Uh, you can see 60% don't get very far, right? So 60% only get up to uh, 100 to 200% of the poverty line. The remaining 40% cross that sort of 200% um, uh, threshold of twice the poverty line. And the 200% line is one that we found in other work is one where the, the likelihood really tails off that you're gonna fall back into poverty. Um, and that sort of shows that here. Uh, so this shows, this basically uses a, the th full three years, the first full three years of the panels, pools them, and then we look at um, for people who start in poverty, where did you hit in that interim year? And then where did you wind, the likelihood that you wound up back in poverty in the third year, okay? So the thing to look at here is the two, the first two yellow bars on the left. Um, so you see that people who only got to 100 to 200% of poverty still had a 38% chance of falling back into poverty in the following year. If you get past that 200% mark, that rate really falls substantially to 24%. And lastly, we know uh, a lot more about these families than just their incomes and these, these core forms of disadvantage. So we can look at other things that people think are important for predicting um, being able to sustainably stay out of poverty. And so particularly we took a, a closer look at employment and work. There's obviously this, this uh, idea that, um, you know, the solution to poverty is a job. Uh, in other work that we've done, you know, we've shown that even, even full-time workers uh, sometimes feel that they're underemployed and don't have enough money to make ends meet in a city like New York. Um, and we have a whole report on that. So the underemployment is a big problem as well. But this just looks at, um, the, the actual work effort being put in by the, the, the low income population, those who are in poverty. And we see that um, you know, still 37% of New Yorkers uh, in poverty uh, have worked 11 to 12 months, who worked full time across the year. Or not just full time, sorry, but, but fully across the year. Um, you know, another 20% have done, have worked at least one month uh, across the, 12, the, the past 12 months. You know, so that's over half uh, of the poor are, are the working poor, basically. Um, but then we look at that other half, right? And we split it down to, to what's going on with those folks. So you can see 14% have health problems, 15% um, you know, are, are over the age of retirement, um, and that's their reason for not working. Um, a small sliver are not working themselves, but have a spouse or a partner who's worked a uh, full year. And so it's only that 11% remainder um, who ha don't, don't show any attachment to the labor force or, or don't have a, a compelling reason for, for non-work. And this just shows the same thing uh, for material hardship, and you can say it's a very similar story, but uh, almost half uh, of those who experience a severe hardship have worked across the whole year. So that's pretty striking. 
um, and even more if you add in part year workers. Um, and again, it's only 6% of uh, those facing uh, a material hardship that, that uh, have no work or, or health challenge or anything like that. Um, so this is the kind of research, oops, this is the kind of report that we're gonna put out every year. Each year I think we'll have like a different focus and, and, uh, and topic, but we'll update all these numbers to get the latest statistics and really keep an eye on the, this, this question of what are the trends in stably getting, out, getting yourself out of poverty. Next year we're gonna look uh, at a deeper dive what are the types of events and things that can knock you off course and, and actually move you into poverty and, and hardship and other forms of disadvantage. So anyway, conclusions. Um, so poverty and other forms of disadvantage do seem to be falling, although falling pretty modestly um, relative to change in the economy. Um, the, just, there's a lot of disparities. We didn't talk about, about, about them as much in this report, um, but there's stark racial and ethnic disparities, uh, differences by age, by gender, et cetera. Um, and like I said, there's, a, there's been this modest and hopeful growth in, in the proportion of New Yorkers who are stably exiting poverty, but we're gonna be keeping an eye on that, especially uh, in the coming years as more and more data comes in. So thank you. Thanks, Chris. And uh, next up, we have Lily Bushman Kopp, who's going to talk about hope, opportunity, and mobility in New York City. Hi. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for being here today. Uh, I'm excited to share some findings from the Poverty Tracker's new module on hope and opportunity. Um, so as Chris touched upon, Robinhood is interested not only in the dynamics that contribute to being or not being in poverty and hardship in New York City, but also understanding what conditions lead to sustained mobility out of poverty. So the poverty tracker decided to ask New Yorkers what they thought about their own chances of mobility. At our 33-month follow-up survey, we included questions about New Yorkers' perceptions of fairness and opportunity and their expectations about their own circumstances improving in the future. Um, so 71% of New Yorkers agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, one of the big problems in this country is that we don't give everyone an equal chance. Over half feel the economic system is basically unfair in that not all Americans have an equal opportunity to succeed. At the same time, only 39% of New Yorkers feel that life in America has gotten better uh, over the past 50 years for people like them. And just 35% believe that children growing up in the United States will be better off financially than their parents. Um, this question of how New Yorkers think today's children will fare is especially interesting when we take a look at it by race and ethnicity. Uh, so overall, 35% think that children today will be better off than their parents. Surprisingly, only 22% of white New Yorkers believe this, while 40% of black New Yorkers and almost half of Hispanic New Yorkers feel that today's children will be better off than their parents. So these are really quite substantial differences uh, across race and ethnicity in how New Yorkers perceive the trajectory of the country, and we found it really interesting given the current political climate. Um, also interesting, Despite this bleak outlook about the economic system in general, New Yorkers feel a real sense of optimism about their personal chances of mobility, both in the coming year and over the next five. Uh, so we asked New Yorkers whether they expected their economic situation to worsen, remain the same, or improve over the next 12 months. Overall, 52% expected improvement, but responses varied quite a bit over race and ethnicity as well as other demographics. Um, black and Hispanic New Yorkers were significantly more likely than white New Yorkers to expect their personal economic situation to improve a little or a lot over the coming year. Uh, those with less than a college degree were more confident about an improvement than those with a college degree or higher. And younger New Yorkers, aged 18 to 34, were the most optimistic about their financial situation improving. We can look at uh, responses to that same question broken down by New Yorkers' experiences of poverty. And you'll notice here, 
New Yorkers who have experienced poverty are more likely to expect improvements in their finances over the next year than those who have never been in poverty, who you'll see in orange there. Um, in fact, three quarters of respondents who had been in poverty consistently over the course of the poverty tracker panel expect their economic situation to improve, making this the most optimistic group, um, followed by those who had recently entered poverty. So again, we're seeing that despite this sense of injustice in the country's economic structure, New Yorkers really remain hopeful that their own situation can improve and that the groups who are often considered the most disadvantaged are the most optimistic in this regard. So what do New Yorkers think it takes to get ahead in life? We asked respondents to rate nine factors in terms of their importance for getting ahead in life on a scale of zero to 10, where zero meant not at all important and 10 meant very important. Um, New Yorkers ranked having a good education and working hard as the most important factors for success. Um, sorry. So we, um, we see that they really place a lot of emphasis on what an individual can do, which may contribute to that sense of optimism. Um, but they also still place higher moderate importance on things that are less subject to an individual's actions or will. Um, so things like having social connections, being born into wealth, or just plain luck, uh, as well as characteristics like being white, male, and heterosexual. And this may contribute to their impression that the economic system is unfair or that the cards are stacked against them. For a long time, the Poverty Tracker has asked New Yorkers to rate their life satisfaction uh, by picturing a ladder with steps numbered from zero at the bottom to 10 at the top. Uh, zero represents the worst possible life and 10 the best. In this module, for the first time, we also asked respondents what step of the ladder they think they'll stand on in five years. And when we look at responses by age, race, and ethnicity, we see that groups who rated their current lives lower than average, and that's looking at the light blue uh, bar, which includes 18 to 34 year olds and black and Hispanic New Yorkers, actually expect greater improvement over the next five years. So looking at the top of the bar. Um, one interesting example, White New Yorkers had a higher current life rating than Hispanic New Yorkers, but they have the same five-year projection. And if we think back, Hispanic New Yorkers were over twice as likely as uh, white New Yorkers to believe children today will do better. Um, so we're also seeing this uh, applying to their own you know, personal situation. Uh, you'll notice there's remarkable consistency in the projected life satisfaction as compared to the current life satisfaction. We see something similar, again, when we look at responses by experiences of poverty and hardship. So although New Yorkers who have experienced poverty have lower current life ratings uh, than those who have not experienced poverty, they, again, expect their lives to improve much more. So the difference in life satisfaction really shrinks in that five-year projection, despite the very challenges that these groups are currently facing. Um, so, you know, we would just say that this is a really demonstrating a strong sense of optimism in the face of hardship, such that New Yorkers from all walks of life have strikingly similar expectations of their life satisfaction and well-being in the near future, regardless of where they start off. So in our Hope and Opportunity module, we asked New Yorkers about their perceptions of mobility and opportunity in the US. And we found that while New Yorkers hold a relatively gloomy outlook on the state of the economy and the trajectory of the country overall, they also remain hopeful that their personal circumstances will get better in the near and longer term future. And those who are facing the most challenges or who might be considered more disadvantaged hold the greatest expectations for improvement. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chloe. Um, or, sorry, Lily. Next up, we have Chloe Cargill, who is talking about emergency funds and asset poverty in New York City.
afternoon, and thank you all for joining us to learn about some of the Poverty Tracker's recent findings. Today, I'll be describing an issue facing almost half of New Yorkers and Americans alike, how to safeguard against an unanticipated emergency expense or financial shock. A 2018 Federal Reserve report revealed that 41% of Americans would need to borrow money, sell property, in order to pay for a modest $400 expense or not be able to cover it at all. So in an effort to understand how New Yorkers would cope with this same expenditure, the Poverty Tracker asked respondents the following question in its annual survey. Suppose that you have an emergency expense in the amount of $400. Based on your current financial situation, how would you pay for this expense? Respondents saw the following answer choices and could select all that apply. Now I'd like to look at some of the ways that people can, that people pay when they're able to. So respondents who were more financially solvent said that they would use money currently in their checking or savings accounts, cash, or its functional equivalent, which is defined as a credit card that would be paid off in full at the next statement. And if you hear me say cash, please know that I mean cash or its functional equivalent. We'll also have a look later on at those subjects who reported not being able to pay at all. Looking first at those who can pay, the Federal Reserve found that 59% of Americans polled would pay with cash or its functional equivalent, whereas the Poverty Tracker found that 55% of New Yorkers could cover this expense with cash. Overall, the Poverty Tracker found that New Yorkers used similar strategies in the absence of having cash. In some ways, New Yorkers were perfectly on par. We'll note that uh, you know both samples were 26% excuse me, 26% of each sample reported that they would need to borrow money from someone that they know. However, there were some notable deviations in how New Yorkers were able to pay. Most remarkably, New Yorkers were 14 percentage points less likely to say that they would sell something in the absence of using cash. Almost one in five Americans chose this response, while only one in 20 New Yorkers surveyed said they would sell property. Considering that New Yorker, New York City residents are non-drivers who rent, it made a lot of sense that New Yorkers might be less likely to sell something or have assets that they're able to liquidate. Another clear distinction between the groups showed that New Yorkers were six percentage points more likely to use this other response. And some of the more prevalent responses here included people saying things like withdrawing funds from a retirement plan or trying to negotiate a payment plan with the debt collector. In line with the 29% of respondents nationally surveyed who couldn't pay at all, the Poverty Tracker learned that 30% of New Yorkers didn't have financial solutions to this $400 problem. They didn't have cash or its functional equivalent, they lacked the assets, and furthermore, they couldn't depend on someone in their social support network for a loan. So circling back to people who can pay and looking at the data by income group, New Yorkers overall were just as likely as Americans in general to pay this $400 emergency with cash. We might assume that being a member of a low income group comes with some fiscal obstacles, but we probably think of this high income group as being protected from a $400 or a, a modest financial shock. And looking at the overall, especially for, uh, especially for the high income group at 82%, it does paint a positive picture. Noticeably, however, we see that black and Hispanic New Yorkers from this group appear to still struggle in times of economic hardship. The data reveals stark contrasts between whites and racial minorities, even those high earners that we mentioned. So this problematic trend emerged both in the national data and also held true for New York as well. What we're seeing here is that being white and low income or even living in poverty sometimes is actually still more protective from a immediate, from a moderate financial shock than it is to be black or Hispanic and to have a high income. And these findings in particular really speak to the racial wealth gap in the United States, but also right here in our own city. So we've talked about what people do when they're using cash or its functional equivalent, but what do they do in the event that they don't have access? And until this point, we've been considering answers to this question of a $400 emergency. But as many of you know, or probably have experienced, financial shocks come in much larger dollar amounts. So we needed to go beyond this question and 
to be able to order, to be able to understand how New York households would cope when facing financial adversity. In addition to collecting, in addition to collecting rich health and income data, the Poverty Tracker conducts a special module on assets and debts. This allows us to look at respondents' ability to cover their basic needs for three months in the event of a job loss. And so using this measure of asset poverty provides us with another means of thinking about financial security. Despite being classified as asset poor, we see that 41% of New Yorkers were still able to manage this $400 emergency with cash, while those among those with assets, still 27% of people were unable to cover with cash or the equivalent. And we might expect the group identified as asset poor to struggle with unexpected expenses or even getting by from one week to the next. But ultimately, I think we expect that the people who have assets are shielded from these types of shocks, although we see that 27% of those deemed safe are just as financially unstable as those who are classified as being asset poor. So maybe later we can discuss some of the reasons why those who are asset poor can cover with cash and why some of the people with assets cannot. Just to review, uh, we have more than 40% of Americans and New Yorkers who wouldn't be able to cover this expense with cash, and there are clear similarities and also some noteworthy differences between the ways that Americans versus New Yorkers would deal with such an emergency. In national and poverty tracker data, we see that race is intimately tied to one's ability to be able to pay. And in addition to not being able to pay for this expense, we see that New Yorkers are even more likely to be asset poor, demonstrating that many New Yorkers across all income brackets are sadly just one $400 emergency away from serious financial hardship. Thank you. So Sophie Collier is going to present on housing and force moves in New York City. This is hot off the presses, came out yesterday, so we're excited to talk about this. Um, good afternoon, and I'm so glad to be here um, with you all to share some of the latest results coming out of the Poverty Tracker with you. So as most of you know, housing in New York City is incredibly expensive, and this places an extra burden on low-income New Yorkers and their families. Uh, neighborhoods in New York City are also rapidly gentrifying, and stories of low-income New Yorkers being pushed out of neighborhoods they've lived in for years are common. And work on eviction led and by Matthew Desmond, among other scholars, has documented the toll that evictions and forced moves take on families, and how they actually serve to widen the opportunity gap between neighborhoods, as those who are forced to move often end up in neighborhoods with greater challenges. And so, Policymakers at the federal, city, state, and local level, well, city obviously, but local level, are looking for ways to combat these forces through rent regulations, tax credits, and a host of other policy choices. So it's against this backdrop that we decided to add questions on forced moves and relocation to the Poverty Tracker. And the Poverty Tracker is a, the, one of the only local, actually the only local survey to capture this information alongside measures of poverty, material hardship, and other, a host of other measures of well-being. So today, I'll present some results from our report on forced moves and evictions in New York City. And it was, as Sarah said, released yesterday, so it's quite exciting. Um, the report was designed to answer four questions. Oh, here, that slide. <laughs> How common are forced moves among New York City's renters? How are those who are forced to move faring with regard to the poverty tracker's key measures of disadvantage? Do forced moves in New York City deepen inequality between neighborhoods? And do rental protections help curb rates of forced moves? I'll start by quick, quickly <laughs> um, explaining how the Poverty Tracker identifies forced moves. So on the housing survey, Poverty Tracker respondents are asked if they moved in the 12 months prior to the survey. And then those who did move are asked to select from a list of reasons to indicate why. We then organize those types of moves according to a typology that Matthew Desmond used that organizes them into three categories. So we have voluntary moves, responsive moves, and forced moves. Now a voluntary move is a move that a tenant really has choice over. So moving to a larger apartment or to an apartment that's closer to work. 
a responsive move is a move in response to something like a neighborhood condition or a housing condition. So if you're having an issue with neighborhood safety and her, or have a landlord who won't fix anything and choose to move, that's a responsive move. And then there are forced moves. And these could be a building that's foreclosed or condemned due to uh, violations or a landlord that's not keeping up with the mortgage. But the most common type of forced move is an eviction, either formal or informal. Oh, so how common are forced moves among renters in New York City? Within a 12-month period, we estimate that roughly 300,000 families in rental housing move. And of those moves, about 20% can be classified as forced. And this translates to 56,000 families and 100,000 New Yorkers being forced out of their homes. Over two-thirds of these forced moves are attributable to an eviction. So forced moves are not uncommon among New York City residents and renters who are moving. As I said earlier, the Poverty Tracker is the only local survey to capture data on forced moves alongside these other measures of disadvantage. Here we look at the prevalence of these different forms of disadvantage among forced movers before they move, as well as those renters who moved for other reasons and renters who didn't move. And of note, over half of those who are forced to move face a material hardship prior to moving, and over half were rent burdened, so spending over 30% of their household income on rent. Issues with mental health were also notably high among this group. So those who are forced to move are often, often those who are already in these vulnerable and precarious positions, and this is another shock and another blow. Um, work in other cities shows that forced moves actually serve to widen opportunity gaps between neighborhoods, as those who are forced to move end up in neighborhoods with greater challenges. And we find that this is also true in New York City. Here, we're looking at the predicted probability of living in a high poverty neighborhood after moving by type of move. So for non-movers, it stays the same. For those who are evicted, however, they often begin in lower poverty neighborhoods and end up in higher poverty neighborhoods. And this result really falls in line with stories of people being evicted from gentrifying neighborhoods. Another interesting finding has to do with these voluntary movers who move because they found a more affordable apartment. So this group is more likely to live in a high poverty neighborhood before moving compared to all other groups and even more so afterwards. We took a closer look into this population to kind of understand their levels of disadvantage and found that over half of members of this group were living below 200% of the poverty line and over, actually it was three quarters were rent burdened. So this is an, actually a pretty disadvantaged group. And while voluntary moves um, in other cities of this type could be thought of as like moving to get a deal, in a really expensive housing market like New York City, it's actually that you're just moving because you can't afford your current apartment. Um, and so there's an idea that you're actually being forced to move by high housing costs. For voluntary movers for, who move for other reasons, however, we find that they start off and end up in lower poverty neighborhoods. Um, an interesting finding for responsive movers too, where they start off in higher poverty neighborhoods or end, often end up in lower poverty neighborhoods, and we can discuss a little bit later about why that might be. We're also interested to see if rental protections help curb rates of forced moves. So here I'm just showing the breakdown of moves from unregulated apartments that have a market set rate, uh, rent rate, versus apartments that are rent controlled or rent stabilized. And we do find that forced moves are a bit more common among moves from rent controlled and rent stabilized units compared to unregulated units. Now, what does that mean? Um, undoubtedly, forced moves would be much more common among those with currently with rent control, rent stabilization, absent these protections. But that doesn't mean that everyone with those protections right now is, I'm going to say protected again, but protected from a forced move. Um, so this uh, really highlights the importance of different policy propo proposals that are in the New York State Senate right now that look to uh, protect renters and tenants facing these forced moves. So our key findings. Over 100,000 New Yorkers are forced out of their housing within a year. Compared to all other renters, those with forced moves, who suffer a forced move, are more disadvantaged across a host of measures of well-being collected by the poverty tracker. 
Evictions are playing a role in concentrating poverty in New York City, and other types of moves related to high housing costs also concentrate poverty and disadvantage. Rental protections help curb rates of forced relocation, but in their current form are not fully protective. Policies that promote housing stability, however, offer, offer an opportunity to counter these trends. So thanks so much, and enjoy the rest of it. <laughs> Are these on? Yep, great. Um, so we're going to take some questions from the audience. I think the microphones will be coming around, so if anybody has any questions. Oh. Oh. Hey, how are you guys doing? i got to pull this off my phone now. I didn't realize I could get to ask so early. Um, so this question actually is for Lily, and my question was primarily about the, the, the optimism um, piece that you mentioned. And I was wondering if there was... When she looked at um, the, the differences in racial and, and optimism between um, r different racial groups and hardship groups, was there any, what's, what are sort of the hypotheses for the reasons in that racial difference that you guys saw? And in our related question, um, you showed the, the different factors of success that people thought led to success, and I was wondering if you guys, it probably just would have been too unwieldy to put on a PowerPoint, but was there, uh, what was the trends in the breakdown of racial and hardship difference on what people thought led to success? Um, yes. Well, to your second question, definitely, it would have been a big spreadsheet. Um, mm -hmm. But I tried to pull out, you know, a few that I thought were interesting in case it came up. Um, you know, there were definite differences across all sorts of demographics. Um, some expected, you know, uh, black respondents did place a higher importance on being white as a factor. Interestingly, Hispanics placed a lower importance on that than whites, um, but a higher importance on being born in the U.S. Um, younger respondents placed less importance on being heterosexual than older respondents. Uh, you know, women placed slightly more importance on being male, but not by as much as you might think. Um, and the more education a respondent had, the less likely they were, or the lower they rated having a good education. So some interesting things, you know, definitely came out of that. Um, and we could go on and on, you know. Um, in terms of some of the differences, it's a great question. I. I'm not sure. I would welcome, um, you know, input. I we did uh, find a Gallup Healthways poll from several years ago that showed similar trends. Um, that showed that Black Americans were the most optimistic demographic group, especially those living in poverty. Um, so these definitely our findings align with other results from other uh, surveys. Um, and I don't. I, I would welcome other, you know, hypotheses on that. Um, but I think it's definitely like a really interesting thing to keep pursuing and looking at. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo everything Lily said. Um, we don't ask any specific questions that get at the reasons per se, but um, you know, I think I think the, the white New Yorkers have historically been a more more advantaged group with more privilege, and you know, there's a sense maybe that there are increasing like, threats to that privilege, right? Um, whereas, you know, the, the Hispanic group in particular um, is more likely to be foreign born, may come with more of a sense of optimism in their, in, their, um, in their move to America, things like that. And then I think there's this general pattern in our results of like, the, most, the most disadvantaged, whether it be by poverty or hardship or any, any demographic, being sort of the most optimistic. So it's like when, when life's knocked you down kind of thing, you, you still see a way up, I guess. Thank you uh, for your presentations. I really enjoyed them. And I have two questions. My first one is for Lily, and it kind of builds off of the last question. If you could kind of share if there are any qualitative uh, data or um, anecdotes or stories about how the optimism that the respondents shared, how that might relate to uh, health or um, kind of the psychological dealing with uh, disadvantage. Um, because one might think that if you're more positive, then 
you have a better outlook that would serve well with health and some of the other indicators that um, the poverty tracker could tell us more about. Um, so just information about that. And then my second question is for Sophie. I was really interested in your findings that some of the regulations like rent controlled or rent stabilized apartments, that they help, but they don't quite help enough. And so I'm wondering if you have any insight into interventions that would be more helpful than those or ways to make uh, have fewer loopholes so that people are not forced out. Uh, so again, thank you for your presentations. Um, so we don't have like a qualitative piece built out on this yet, although that would be really interesting. From my experience interviewing New Yorkers, I find that um, uh, religion, like often I'm hearing a lot of stories of real hardship. I think that uh, these interviews, although quantitative, do give people an opportunity to speak to what they're dealing with in a way that they may not always have the place to voice. Um, so we do hear a lot about the health struggles, the you know, trouble making ends meet. Um, I find that like faith and religiosity kind of comes up. Uh, that's sort of, you know, I hear a lot of like, thank God, you know, it could be worse. I just try to kind of keep keep faith and keep moving forward. Um, but I don't know, you know, people are less sort of sharing like their triumphant stories. Um, but just to your point that like, this is definitely an important psychological piece. And we really think that, you know, optimism is a community asset. And like, we need to focus on that as a capacity and think about, you know, how that can be utilized to sort of move people forward. I was going to say, um, one of the cool things that we're adding this summer, hopefully, is a qualitative component that will go on more regularly, and Lily's going to help with that. Um, but we're developing sort of like a protocol where we can sort of routinely collect stories, not just on this hope stuff, but on, on, on broader factors. So hopefully that's coming soon. And um, on the kind of question of, um, a question about what are the interventions that could help make sure that people in rent control and rent stabilized units are protected. There are a number of bills that are right now in the New York, New York State Assembly, um, and the three I can think of that really address this have to do with the vacancy decontrol, so that you ensure um, landlords can't switch the apartment to a market rate apartment once it's been vacant for a while. And there are also these capital improvements that um, landlords can sometimes make, and once they've made those improvements, to either the, the building space or your actual apartment, um, they can charge you a higher rent because of those in the, um, improvements. And those are the two big loopholes in which um, this population is really affected. Um, in, the, in the local level, there's a New York City's right to counsel movement where um, kind of guaranteeing, right now it guarantees a lawyer in housing court um, if you have income below 200% of the official poverty So raising those thresholds is another way to make sure that people who receive an eviction notice are, you know, have uh, counsel when in housing court. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering on the hope uh, question for Lily, if um, some of what you're finding is that the groups that are more likely to have achieved what they expected to in life, the whites, the better educated, the middle age, um, are, you know, they're not saying I expect to be better off in five years because they're already about where they expected to be. And may that be playing into the findings because, you know, I'm thinking of just a life cycle, you would expect younger people to think they'll be better off in five years than older people. And so I'm wondering if, if you control for um, where people are <laughs> economically, whether you still see as much difference in hope among the different ethnic groups and, um, and by age. That's a great question. And I think those are, you know, are well taken points. 
younger people are just, you know, sort of starting off their careers and hopefully are expecting bright futures. Um, I don't know. We didn't do any uh, controlling for, I mean, other than sort of looking at these um, perceptions by, you know, income status. I don't know that we've like controlled for sort of like where a person is in their life cycle, but it's a very interesting question. Um, it also makes me think we're gonna hopefully introduce some questions about like student debt, and I'm curious to know, like, you know, on the one hand, yes, people have kind of achieved what they thought they would, right? I'm thinking of that college educated group, but what are the sort of other factors maybe that are um, balancing that out or Balancing. Other questions? Hi, thanks. Um, is there is there room in the addition of the of more oops, a set of qualitative questions or other in the tracker to to use it to unlock some of what Wes was talking about in terms of uh, sort of user insights or people's experiences with different sets of benefits or different city agencies or, or interventions that have been less. Or, bet or more successful for them in sort of the design of, of better interventions? Um, we have uh, a number of things that speak to that in, in one facet or another. Um, we have a whole module on people's experiences with services, um, and those are both nonprofit services but also government services. So um, we, we know people's satisfaction with different types of government uh, agencies and services. Um, that are available in their neighborhood. We, we ask broad questions about the struggles people are facing and what, what they, where they've gone to for help and then whether they found those sources actually made meaningful improvements. So we have a couple of reports on, on that already. Um, and uh, what am I forgetting? The qualitative follow-up. Oh, right, right, right. Um, we also did a, um, Robin Hood had a, a campaign to uh, increase benefit uptake, and so we did a whole couple modules on um, people's use of the EITC and on SNAP, and looking at the reasons why people do or do not go to those agencies. So we've that type of data as well. Yeah. Um, Chris, I think you said that um, once you got over 200 percent of the poverty threshold, the op, uh, chances of recidivism went down dramatically. Um, can you say a little bit more about why that is? Um, uh, well, I wouldn't call it recidivism, but <laughs> but um, uh, you know, I, I think as Wes was saying, sort of the poverty line is, is pretty low, right? Um, so, a family of four, twenty-five thousand dollars, even thirty-two thousand dollars, still twice that for a family of four, sixty, you know, sixty-four thousand dollars, right? So. Um, in, a, in a high cost place like New York City, as Sophie's data shows, um, as the hardship data show that you know it's still extending pretty far up the income distribution. It's not just enough to cross that line, which is already pretty low. You know, even with the improvements in the methodology, um, it's still not it's still not like a, a self sufficiency standard or anything like that. So, um, you know, there are people who, who create self-sufficiency standards, and those lines are substantially higher than the poverty line. So I think what we're seeing partly is you need to get to a certain level in order to be self-sufficient and and not fall not and decrease the likelihood of falling back in. I think it was 24. Is that right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and down from like 40 something, uh, if I recall. Hello. Uh, thanks so much for this. Um, I have a ton of questions. I'd love to read uh, the report, so I'll, I'll save all my skeptical questions. But I do want to ask um, about whether you have um, tried to bring any of these different subjects together. Um, the question that I'd most like to see answered out of what I think you have all the data points is um, do people who can cover a $400 shock with cash um, are they buffered in any way by having that from um, either a forced move or from um, falling back uh, into poverty or, or are they helped on the flip side 
to um, sustainably exit poverty. So does, does the ability to cover that $400 shock serve as a buffer? I think you could prove this out of your data, and I would love to see it. Mm -hmm. did, we, did we look at that? No. no. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also, it's like a, an interesting indicator and proxy for a lot of other things, right? So it's, in one way, it discusses your, do you have a social network, so you have people to turn to, right. and to buffer many different um, experiences and, and shocks. Um, but yeah, how it yeah. just interacts with all of these things. So I think we, oh. Uh, so I think we, we definitely can uh, look at that. If you send us an email, we could probably be more likely to follow up and do it. Um, you know, one of the challenges I think with this data is uh, with quarterly surveys, there's just a, there's a tremendous volume of data. Um, and we've made the whole first panel public, so any, you know, students or researchers out there can go and, uh, and, and take a crack at this data. We're really close to making the second panel public and so part of what we're hoping to do is get people aware of the data and people can go use it to answer whatever questions of interest. I know that doesn't answer your direct question but uh, and I'm not saying you have to go do it yourself but uh, but but um, there are lots of opportunities with this data because there, there's stuff we haven't even you know there's things in the data we haven't even broached yet. So Perhaps we'll try and sneak that into our annual report this year. <laughs> um, I think that was our last question uh, but thank you to the full panel for presenting these findings and the great questions. We have a break now for about 15 minutes and then we'll, we'll re resume here.
and it's sort of collecting the ACS disability questions to uh, break down for people with disabilities in New York City. Um, yeah. 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 You might, wa you might want to consider the, the six questions of the ACS. Yeah. Because I, I would love to try and use that since we, we know that there is such a high correlation between disability and poverty. But with the work limit, yeah, yeah. But with the work limitation, you're not. I mean, you might be capturing some of them, but you might be missing a lot. Social connectedness, how isolated people might be. So that would go towards material hardship. I just. Uh, so social connectedness is one, but environmental conditions, water quality, noise.
whatever's going to get us back on time, you know. Whatever you guys want. Honestly, I don't mind. If they give it needs to be 10, 10 is okay. I don't care. The clean up hitter? Do you the clean up hitter? Baseball terminology. Okay. Come on. The clean, the clean up hitter comes in and hits the home run after everybody like gets on base. To the leadoff hitter, I'm just looking for a walk or, you know. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? I want to make sure the mic's turned. Folks, for everyone. Um, um, we're going to go ahead and get started again. My name is Mark Harris. And um, oh, and before that, I say that, I want to just um, make sure everyone has a chance to seat to, to sit down. The line for coffee was long, so I think everyone will be pretty alert for this panel. Um, my name is Mark Harris, and I am a program officer in the poverty program at the JPB um, Foundation. Um, JPB's poverty program believes that everyone in the U.S. deserves a fair chance to achieve their goals for themselves, their families, and their communities, and that we must provide hope and tangible opportunities for children born into poor families and for all people struggling to make ends meet and to move and to stay out of poverty. Um, the first panel today um, highlighted analysis um, of data from the Poverty Tracker. Um, the Poverty Tracker, as you know, focuses on New York City, but the Center on Poverty and Social Policy um, does poverty research nationwide. And JPB Foundation is very proud to be a partner to the Center on supporting the work of these scholars that you see on this panel today. Um, the format of this panel is going to be pretty similar to the first one. Um, we're just going to sort of hand off um, to each panelist, and they're going to do these discussions. And so I'm actually just going to throw it to um, Robert John Hartley, Robert Paul Hartley, I'm so sorry. Um, and he's going to talk about um, income support policies for the 2020 election. John Robert is my son's name, so it's fine. I love the name. All right, good afternoon again, and, and thank you all again for being here. So this, uh, this analysis began at the beginning of the year, looking around, and there were a lot of people who started running for president of the United States and announcing that they were going to be on the Democratic ticket. Or, uh, and, and at the same time, we saw that there's a lot of really bold and progressive policy proposals coming out, some of which with the potential to have a real impact on poverty in America. And so. That's something that our, our Poverty Center is certainly concerned with. So we have a, a team of people here. Uh, so myself, Sophie Collier, who spoke earlier, Chris Weimer, and then Sarah Kimberlin, who's not here. Um, so, so we put together some analysis on a series of, of policy proposals. And so I'm gonna first just characterize, uh, uh, characterize five of these proposals uh, that we're gonna show poverty effects for. And I'm gonna try to go a little bit uh, like cautiously and carefully here so we can kind of like uh, get our terminology because then I'll, I'm going to refer to these throughout. So um, 
and I'll, I'll categorize them also. So one of them is a child tax credit reform. So um, the American Family Act would essentially take the current child tax credit, make it more generous, and uh, make it uh, essentially eliminate the earnings requirement and the phase in so that people with the lowest incomes are also seeing these child tax credits that they wouldn't have otherwise been eligible for. And, and they're larger. So uh, a lot of potential poverty effects for um, the very low uh, income and, and those with children. Uh, so, and I'll refer to these as their acronyms throughout. So AFA is the American Family Act. This is what you'll see on the charts coming up. Uh, and, and actually, not long ago, one of the co-sponsors, uh, Representative Delaro, was here giving a, a, an address. Uh, so it was really great to, to see her. Um, uh, Senators Brown and Bennett, Representatives Delaro and Del Benny are on this. So there's two renter's credit proposals that I will show results for. The Rent Relief Act, which is uh, Senator Kamala Harris, and uh, this, and, and basically I'll describe both of these together. They're, they're pretty similar. The, the Home Act is uh, another renter's credit proposed by Cory Booker. And so, um, Essentially what these are going to do is look at the gap between people who are paying more than 30% of their income on rent and, uh, and what they're actually paying. And, and, and in that gap, uh, the RRA will basically give a credit that's worth about 25% of that gap to 100% depending on income. And it's capped at 150% a, a of fair market rent. The HOME Act is really similar, but it's 100% of the gap. and. Uh, and, but it's capped at 100% fair market rent. So there's um, some slight differences there, uh, but as you can see, the, the HOME Act is uh, a little bit larger, a good bit larger in terms of total, total benefits, 134 billion compared to 93 billion. And then the last two uh, are earned income tax credit reforms. And so um, the first one is the, the GAIN Act. So a total cost of 111 billion. This will essentially make the earned income tax credit uh, more generous at every level. So it's, it's lifting up the, uh, the maximum guarantees and then so the phase-ins just become steeper and then phasing out steeper. Whereas the LIFT Act uh, is also reforming the EITC, but it's just adding extra benefits on top of the current EITC, um, another 3,000 per individual or household head or 6,000 for married couples. So, um, <coughs> excuse me. So these are the five proposals um, that I'll be looking at. <coughs> and I do have water here. My, uh, all of you that have been coughing this morning, I, or I can commiserate with you. So, uh, so the data are going to be nationally representative using the current population survey, uh, the most recent year of data available. We're, since these are all tax reforms, uh, I know that there are other policy pr proposals out there, but we're looking at specifically tax credit reforms. Uh, so we're gonna first simulate the, the taxes using uh, tax sum and uh, calculate our baseline poverty rates based on these simulated taxes so then we can compare more evenly with our simulated uh, tax reforms. And then of course we're, we're continuing to use the supplemental poverty measure for our poverty evaluation. So again here you can just see the differences in the total cost for these programs and I'm going left to right in terms of uh, the least expensive to most expensive. So I apologize, the child tax credits first and then it's going to go Renter's credit, EITC, renter's credit, EITC, because now we're in, in cost order. Uh, but if you can just remember, RRA has rental in it, and home sounds like rental. So those are your renter ones there. All right. So uh, a, a range of costs from $91 billion to $247 billion with Lyft. And Lyft, notably, like in the name, is the Lyft the Middle Class Act. So it's a, it's a much more expensive program because it's really targeted very broadly uh, at a lot of Americans. So just to get a sense of how much of that money is going to people who are living uh, with income below poverty level, um, that's what you see there in that bottom, in those bottom shaded areas. 26 billion of the AFA, of that child tax credit, is going to people who are in poverty, compared to 39 billion for Lyft. So Lyft is a much bigger program in general, but um, you can see that uh, they, they differentially target people who have really uh, uh, incomes below poverty. If we think about deep poverty, uh, these are families with incomes less than half of the poverty threshold. And so you can see there that there's really not much difference between uh, the American Family Act at 91 billion and what Lyft is doing. They're, they're essentially providing about the same amount of money to those who are in deep poverty. Um, okay, so I mean, 
some of this will kind of show up when I am showing you results. The results um, for poverty, you can just kind of keep in mind that they're spinning different levels. So, um, but the targeting is different too. So in the end, I'll come back and show you cost equalize. What if they all spent as much as the most expensive program and what the poverty impact would be then? So I'm going to show you the poverty impacts for total population. Also, children under age 18, uh, because the AFA specifically targets children. And also childless adults. Uh, one of the things that both the EITC credits do is uh, provide more money to adults without children than uh, the current EITC. And, um, and the renters credits are also um, very um, helpful to childless adults uh, who are working and poor. So, <clears throat> the, uh, so what you'll see at the top is the baseline poverty based on our, our tax sim uh, simulations. And then the bars will show you what poverty would be under each reform. So the, the reform uh, is having an effect of between 15% reduction to 20% reduction. So for Lyft, about a fifth of poverty is, is eliminated. Um, and, and then for the others, it's, it's a little bit even, but around 15% around of poverty reduction uh, for the total population. If we look at just children, <clears throat> the AFA does a lot better. It's targeting children. Um, and so uh, you see um, that poverty would fall to 9.5% for the AFA. Um, and then the others, again, are uh, fairly similar in terms of how, how they would help uh, for children, especially from gain, home, and lift. And then childless adults uh, would see significant reductions, again, um, especially when you think about the, these, uh, the large EITC uh, grants from Lyft. So if you're um, just an individual, again, that's adding $3,000 of maximum credit that you could be receiving compared to around 500, I think, uh, for the, the current EITC. Um, uh, so that, that could be quite a, quite a bump. Um, all right, so, so here's the question is, um, <coughs> we're comparing poverty impacts. Uh, these aren't necessarily programs that are designed all to address poverty, um, but they certainly have poverty implications. Um, and the, the costs vary widely. So, and, and as we saw, we've also seen that uh, the distribution of how much is targeted toward the poor can vary. So basically, what would it look like if they all spent as much as the, as the LIFT Act, is the kind of thought exercise here. So first I'm going to go back and show you again the total cost and the amounts that are going to people who have incomes below poverty versus uh, those with incomes above poverty. And now we're, if we just lift everyone up to the same level as uh, the lift expenditures, then you can see how much money uh, would be going to the poverty uh, in, in, in this scenario. And so for the renter's credits, you can see it's quite high. Um, I have some slides kind of in the appendix that show the geographic breakdown. Some of this is really driven by states like New York and California, where the cost of living is, is so high and rent is a really big part of that. Um, and then you can also see here how much uh, the AFA really focuses its, uh, its uh, benefits towards those who are in poverty. So here are the same poverty effects that I showed a moment ago. Uh, except now we're all spending the same level at, at 247 billion, which is you know, quite a, um, a large ticket. Um, so now Lyft isn't the one that has the most poverty reduction. It was giving a lot of poverty reduction before, but largely because it's just spending so much, um, the generosity is so high. Uh, the renters credits are the ones providing the most poverty reduction, but again, that's not evenly distributed necessarily across the geography in the United States. Uh, if you look at the AFA, uh, now, uh, with, when you increase its spending, this is way more than, I think the, the next session coming up is how to reduce poverty by half. But if you spent this much on the AFA, you would be doing uh, a reduction by about 60%, much, much larger. Uh, and then again, uh, the results for childless adults. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So uh, just some, some key findings that stand out is that across the board, the, the poverty uh, for these proposals would fall between 15 and 22 percent. I didn't show the results, but I, I have them also in the appendix, that um, for deep poverty, it would reduce deep poverty by 10 to 17 percent across those programs. Per dollar spent, the um, American Family Act, focusing on the child tax credit, is going to do the most for, for children. 
the renter's credits would provide the most reduction for childless adults. Uh, again, there's that geographic uh, kind of caveat. And then the two EITC reforms, uh, they're really looking at people who are working. Uh, a lot of the middle class are going to benefit. So at least 45% of these funds are going to people above one and a half times the poverty line. Uh, but again, Lyft is so uh, generous in its total spending that uh, it provides the most benefits to people below uh, 1.5 times the threshold. Um, so I'll put these summary uh, points here, and I, I think I'm about out of time, but uh, millions of no matter which of these policies, we're trying to evaluate what would the effects look like and let people kind of consider those, but not make a, any kind of a, a race between them. Um, but each of them could move millions out of poverty. Uh, we don't model behavioral responses here, but you can imagine that uh, there might be some small labor responses perhaps, or uh, one of the long-term uh, uh, things that we don't model is that there could be greater investment in children that have long-term uh, benefits uh, that also aren't modeled here. Um, but with the 44 million people in poverty in 2017 and, and the over 100 million that are um, near poor or, or low income below 200% of poverty, uh, I think it's significant to think about how they would be affected by such uh, large national policy proposals. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And next we'll have Naomi Zodi, um, who's going to speak on um, baby bonds and the case for reducing racial inequality. Um, okay, I am very excited to, there we go, to be able to share this with you guys because I think that it is a really important policy idea that is um, like unbelievably feasible we can make substantial headway in reducing racial wealth inequality and the concentration of wealth in this country, and it wouldn't really cost that much money to do it. Okay, so first of all, just to give you an idea of the magnitude of the challenge that I think this generation is facing. If, you, if there was 100 people to represent the United States and $100 to represent all of its wealth, if this were a perfectly equal society, we would give each one dollar, right? Well, we don't exactly do that. First, what we do is we give forty dollars to one person. We give the next forty dollars to the next nine. And then that leaves us with twenty dollars to sprinkle across the other ninety of us. Not only is wealth extremely concentrated, that was a snapshot from the year 2016. It's actually growing more and more concentrated over time. And the way that's happening, as you can see in this graphic, is that all of the new wealth that's been created over the past several decades has gone to the top 1% of wealth holders. So as we've grown increasingly automated and that has enabled us to create more economic output, all of the wealth from that advancement has gone to a small share of the population. Largely, this is driven by a class of white billionaires, right? So as that the spread of wealth is expanding, it's widening like an accordion, those who are at the top are moving further to the top. So those who are at the bottom, historically disadvantaged um, demographics who haven't had generations to accumulate and transfer wealth between generations, they have more and more distance to make up and they're further and further away from kind of the, the locus of where wealth is. So in 1983, white families had about five times the wealth of black families, and today it's seven times for society overall. So in a just society, we would have broad access to capital. And there's some intuitive theory to, to to look at, to explore this idea. First of all, wealth is different from income. Income is a flow over time, and it helps you meet your, your current needs, your contemporary needs. But wealth is something that acts kind of like insurance. You know, when you purchase insurance, it's a product that provides you with peace of mind. It's something you know in the back of your head is there to absorb shocks. So a just society might have broad access to peace of mind. 
And also because you have that stable foundation, it enables you to make choices to move forward. Um, people who, even at the same level of income, students who come from wealthier families, they're more likely to attend four-year institutions and they're more likely to graduate from college. There's more educational advancement. You're better able to step outside of your current um, environment when you have that stable foundation to move from. And finally, because it provides you social standing within your community. So if people have access to capital to start businesses, a more diversified economy is a resilient economy. You're less um, susceptible to the dictates of any one particular employer, for example, who might want to dictate tax rates or conditions of employment. If there are a lot of different employers, then the municipality is more resilient to those pressures. But also, just on the individual level, if you start a business, you have autonomy, and maybe you hire one or two people, and you have standing in your community. So that can be broadly distributed as well in a just society. Essentially, it's power. Wealth is power. And that is shared in, when we have justice. So there are existing policies out there that are made to support wealth building and capital accumulation. One of them is like 529s. And the way it works, it's you save money for college, for kids to go to college. But you, the parents have to put the money in in the first place, so you have to have extra money. And also, the way that it incentivizes that is by giving you a tax break. So the lowest income households don't pay taxes, and they don't get tax breaks. And those who have the highest money, uh, the highest rates of income, they have the highest rates of income tax. So the dollar value of that incentive is necessarily going to be greatest for people who have the highest income. So it's like, it's a very regressive way to support wealth building among people who already have access to that. Individual development accounts is another idea that has been piloted. And it's, it's still, the problem is that it's really hard to save money when you're poor. So families would put money into these accounts and if they didn't take it out in 10 years, then uh, the state or a philanthropic institution would match that money, but most of them, ended up having to dip into it without being able to get the match. So this idea, this policy idea, it, it, it's designed to kind of shore up those shortcomings. The way that it works is, first of all, it's a universal publicly funded trust fund account for every newborn born in the United States. Everybody gets something, but those whose parents have the most wealth get a very little amount, up to um, just the minimum is $500. But those whose parents have the least wealth, they get the most amount, up to $50,000. And you can't touch that money until the child becomes a young adult. So you didn't put the money in in the first place. You can't touch it in the meantime. It will grow for you in a federally managed. It's actually equity. It's called baby bonds, just for the alliteration. But it's like a, it's like a bank account. So at a total cost of $80 billion, we want to know, could this make headway on those big problems? So the way that I'm going to evaluate that policy is using this, it's like longitudinal data from the panel study of income dynamics. It's been following families in the US from 1968 to today. So I take a cohort of young adults in the 2015 PSID, and I say, had we implemented this in the late 80s, early 90s when they were born, what would wealth inequality look like today? The way that I'm allocating the bond money, it's not just that it ranges from 500 to 50,000. It's also the way that I'm administering the money I'm trying to make as progressive of a distribution as possible. So the way that I'm going to do it is an inverse hyperbolic sign function. I know those are like three words you might not want to hear. <laughs> but it's basically just a log. And it's like you know a log and a log. You just kind of put them together. It's exactly the same as log above and below 10 and negative 10, um, symmetric about the 0. And the point is that it's more progressive than a linear regression. So as wealth increases either way, the bond value is decreasing. The wealth is on the x. But with the bond, which is in purple, as wealth increases, the bond value just like falls down, it plummets. So that was what I was trying to do with this. So let's see what we can do. First of all, current wealth of young adult households in the PSID, it, the median, I'm looking at medians here, so right, the typical person right in the middle of the distribution is 29,000. But it's very different between black and white. So currently the ratio at the median is that young white adult households have 15.9 times, 16 times the wealth that young black adults have. 16 times. Okay, 
with baby bonds, first of all, everybody is brought up. That's because it's a universal program. But black people are going to be brought up by more. And it reduces that racial wealth disparity at the median from a factor of 16 to only 1.4. Again, the way that it does this is by bringing up the bottom by more than it's bringing up the top. So at the 25th percentile, where they're currently at zero, and probably this is 2015, so maybe less than that now as student loans have increased. Um, you know, when a person goes from zero to 30,000, it can be a meaningful change for the way that they live their lives. Another thing I wanted to look at is what it does to the concentration of wealth. And essentially what happens is, so we're moving from the top 10% holding among young adults, 72% of all wealth, to that top 10% holding 65% of all wealth. It doesn't sound like that much of a change, but actually Thomas Piketty writes that in all known societies, at all known times, the top 10% have held between 60 and 90% of all wealth. So going from 72 to 65 might be meaningful movement along the continuum of egalitarianism in recorded history. Um, so, <laughs> so, I mean, in conclusion, the, the idea of baby bonds can meaningfully improve well-being. Some of the kinds of indicators that the Federal Reserve takes on economic well-being is, would you be able to borrow $3,000 from anyone you know? This is similar to like what Chloe was talking about earlier, and do you expect to inherit money? These are the kinds of things that would, would, would be completely changed with baby bonds, right? You know, would you have access to $3,000? That changes, you can. Do you expect to come into a sum of money to help you throughout your life? Yeah, I mean, people will perhaps have more optimism. Um, and finally, what it can help also to do is to prevent future poverty and future need and the kind of neglect, abuse, and trauma that can come from that. Thanks. And finally, um, Jane Walt Fogel is going to follow up the world historical effects of baby bonds with um, a discussion of paid family leave and child care, and then we'll have time for questions. How do I get out of? I have to say I'm loving this session because at the center we've spent a lot of time in the last few years sort of playing defense, looking at terrible policy proposals, pro proposals to eliminate low-income heating and energy assistance. I'm looking at Diana Hernandez. Or proposals to cut food stamps. And so this is more, much more um, rewarding work that we're doing now, which is looking at forward-looking proposals that would actually expand the safety net and reduce poverty. So it's been really um, fun doing this work. So I'm going to look at paid family leave and child care in combating poverty. Um, they're right now on the policy agenda, and so I thought, you know, it would be nice to round up this session to talk about what role they could play in reducing poverty today and in the future. So, um, you know, I do a lot of work on paid family leave, so I'm kind of biased. I think it's an important policy area. But we are the only rich country that doesn't have paid family leave. Uh, we have 12 weeks of unpaid leave through the FMLA for part of the workforce. Some people are covered by employer policies, but people who are low income, work part time, Hispanic especially, are less likely to be covered. It's on the policy agenda because six states now have enacted paid family leave. There's been legislation filed in Congress, and there's a lot of interest in this across the aisle. Um, so uh, President Trump has talked about paid maternity and paternity leave, and his daughter Ivanka uh, is a big fan of this. I was talking with Ron Haskins uh, earlier about being baffled. I received a, an email from somebody at the WH, and neither of us knew what the WH was. Ron said, all his years in Washington, nobody has ever referred to the White House as the WH, but this is what... <laughs> This is where we're at now, so I've even heard from the WH who's interested in this. Um, so this is why I think it, it, it could affect poverty. If, if somebody doesn't have paid leave and they have an event, like they have a baby or their child is seriously ill, their mother is seriously ill, they're seriously ill, their partner, they may forego leave, okay, 
But some people may just end up taking unpaid leave and borrowing money to cover expenses. We have really good data on this. This is what people do. They borrow money because they can't cover. They don't have the money, as we heard earlier from, from Chloe, to cover a short-term financial shock. Uh, they go on welfare. They go into debt. Uh, some people quit their jobs altogether uh, if it's a serious enough illness they, and they don't have leave because these are recurring events. So paid leave would improve economic well-being for groups B and C, the people who are getting it themselves in debt or the people who are quitting their jobs altogether. Um, in future, there's a host of research. The evidence here is really strong. Paid leave improves women's employment and earnings. It reduces turnover, increases work experience, provides an incentive for young women to be in the labor market before they have children because they're going to get leave. Um, also would improve child development, which then pays off in terms of reductions in intergenerational poverty. So we have a host of evidence around promoting breastfeeding, reducing maternal depression, increasing father involvement, and improving infant health, reducing infant mortality. So these are all really important uh, improvements in intergenerational well-being. Okay, turning to child care. So you notice there are no estimates there on paid leave, but I just felt like we should talk about it. Um, turning to child care, um, when Rob is not evaluating the other five proposals that he talked about, he's also been working on child care proposals. So I'm going to talk about that work, but I just want to be clear that this has been led by Rob, who's finishing up his second year as a postdoc with us, and he's been fabulous. I should say Naomi's finishing up her second year as a postdoc with us and has been fabulous. Um, so yeah, Rob in his spare time has been looking at these four child care proposals. So there's the Elizabeth Warren universal child care proposal covering 100% of expenses for families with incomes below 200% of poverty, and then any expense that's above what's a reasonable percentage of your income for all other families. So it really is universal. It has a big price tag, $68 billion. Another sort of universal type child care program would only uh, affect families with incomes below 150 percent of state median. So it's sort of similar in spirit to Warren's but with a smaller price tag and it's not truly universal. So that's the Murray and Scott. Then there's two proposals that extend the child and dependent care tax credit. I have to say the child and dependent care tax credit is not my favorite policy. Uh, the name is, is super unwieldy. Um, it's very unwieldy also for families to claim it, and it's mainly claimed by middle-income families, not by low-income families. But these proposals would extend it, making it fully refundable and bringing it up to 100% of your expenses if you're low enough income. So I actually like these proposals, even though I don't really like the Child and Independent Care Tax Credit. So the first of these is the larger one at $39 billion. And the second one is the smaller one, making it fully refundable up to 50% of your expenses maximum. And that's only $11 billion. So as Rob was stressing in the other analysis he presented, these things come with different price tags. So when I say we simulated, I mean Rob simulated the effect of the four proposals using the SPM. Here we actually have a labor supply response. You can't talk about child, making child care more affordable without thinking more people are going to go to work because more people will go to work if you expand child care and make it more affordable. So we do build in a labor supply response. We're working on changes in the use of child care. That's much trickier. Um, so this is just to remind you of what the price tags are for these different proposals. It's not that pr if you go to like Elizabeth Warren's proposal, the number is different than 68 billion. This isn't the price tag of her proposal because she has other things in there, quality improvements and all that. This is the price we get when we give this benefit to families and the microdata and they claim it and they're, they're claiming the money. So just to be clear about that. But you can see there, as with Rob's earlier presentation, there's a range of generosity. And with his earlier presentation, there's a range of targeting. So uh, the Elizabeth Warren one on the, on your, on the end there, the UCCEL, um, it spends a lot more money, but it's actually less targeted than some of the other programs. So 38% of the money is going to people who are high income, because remember, people above 200% of poverty, because remember, it's truly universal. So it's even subsidizing childcare costs for folks who are nowhere near poverty. So it helps the middle class, it's fabulous, it's probably good for gender equality, probably good for child development, lots of things, 
but it's not going to be so targeted in terms of poverty. So um, here's the reveal. So what does this mean in terms of uh, the anti-poverty effects? And let's focus on the second row, which is not so much the effects for all children, because we really want to focus on the effects for children where the families are paying for child care, because that's really the target population. So you can see the two, the two proposals at the end, uh, the ones that are expanding um, subsidies for child care, universal, it's universal type child care, are reducing uh, poverty by quite a bit. But the Warren one with a much higher price tag. And then uh, the two expansions of the child, ta child and dependent care tax credit do much less because they're much more modest programs. But again, with varying impact, one has an impact that's twice as big because it would spend twice as much money. So um, these kinds of analyses are just really useful because you're not really comparing apples to apples with these proposals. You're comparing an apple to an orange, to a banana, <laughs> to a pineapple. So uh, it's really worthwhile to be able to precisely pinpoint. Uh, and we're close to releasing this. I think we're just going to try to do something more about the child care response. Uh, but I think Rob's basic intuition on the child care response is correct. We assume that people, if they move to different types of child care or use more child care, are not going to do things that throw them into poverty. So it's not going to affect our poverty estimates much. It will affect our estimates around the costs of the program. So we do want to get that right. So, and again, mm -hmm. child care should affect poverty in future, not just reducing families' out-of-pocket expenditures today, but it should improve parental employment and earnings, reduce financial insecurity and material hardship, which is really bad for children, improve child health and development, and increase their employment and earnings in the future if the child care is of good enough quality. So I wanted to include this because these are not primarily anti-poverty policies, but they do have anti-poverty effects both in today and in the future. And if we don't look at those anti-poverty effects, we're likely to understate the benefits of these kinds of programs. So it's important, I think, to do these analyses. And I just want to acknowledge uh, a bunch of different collaborators and funders on the paid leave work. And um, I did want to make sure that I mentioned that Rob was the lead person on the child care work. And um, that's it. So once again, we're opening up the floor to questions and the uh, microphones are going to start to go around. So if you have a question, just raise your hand, and I think we have our first one over here. Mm -hmm. yes, yeah, me. hi. Um, I had a question about the baby bonds idea. Um, has this been tried anywhere in the world? And the second part of my question was, um, do you, would you anticipate any effect on fertility rates? For instance, in the United States, the fertility rate now is below replacement, you know, certainly much lower in Japan and Europe. Well, okay, so for the first part, it was kind of tried in the UK. Uh, and what happened was, similarly to the way that the Booker proposal, which is a little bit different from the study that I looked at, which was uh, based on Derek Hamilton and Sandy Darities, but um, it would give you a little bit of money every year rather than a lump sum at the beginning, but it would still be about the same amount at the end. So in the UK, they did it that way as well. But what happened was a conservative administration took power after just a couple of years. So they did away, they stopped putting money into the program. So it was just like a couple of thousand dollars for people born between like this month and that month. You know, so it, it, it hasn't really happened on a larger scale. In terms of its effects on fertility rates, I think that fertility rates are so, uh, I mean, so I guess in, in Japan, as you mentioned, in Japan and Europe, where they have more social services and more of a social safety net, they still have really low fertility rates. So um, I'm not sure. It's interesting. But, uh, yeah. I mean, the, the European countries and some of the Asian countries have tried really hard to shift fertility with, you know, a host of things, whether it's things that look like baby bonds or child allowances or birth supplements or child care. It, they've proven really hard to shift. It's really hard to shift fertility rates. And the baby bonds initiative that Naomi was talking about in the UK was part of a much bigger anti-child poverty strategy, which didn't affect fertility rates. Mm -hmm. So it, it's funny. It's a question that always comes up in the United <coughs> States. But I think the Europeans sort of know that nothing they do seems to touch fertility, although they've tried really hard. The next question. Oh, it's over here. 
All right, thank you for your presentations. I had two questions, one for Robert and one for Naomi. Um, for Robert, I really appreciated the thought experiment, um, and I'm interested in the opposite thought experiment. So what would it mean if we asked which policy um, might do the best if we were spending the least amount, um, often because policies do not always spend at the top of their budget. So I'm really wondering what would be, which would have the results if we spent the least. Um, and then for Naomi, I was really interested um, in the idea of the baby bond, and I'm wondering what it would take to implement something like this. So the way that you envision it, would it mean reforming the limited policies that exist? So you talked about the 529s, or would it be something different? And also, would there be any stipulations to how the baby bond money could be used um, if it were in place? So I'll go ahead and start. Um, yeah, thank you. Great question. So we actually put out a, a policy brief on this, and in the in the brief we do that. We have uh, basically the set I showed, and another set where we say, what if they all spend a hundred billion, which is around the, uh, the. I think the patterns that you saw um, before <coughs> basically still hold the same type of patterns. But the, the one thing that maybe stands out a little bit is that if you um, when you spend that much more on the AFA, it really kind of gives it even more distance between the others uh, in terms of how much it really reduces poverty for, for children. Um, and then uh, a lot of them, the effects are really similar to what you saw because the other ones are kind of clustered closer to 100 billion. But, but yeah, it's, it's a good question, thanks. Okay, so in terms of, I think there were two questions. One, how would it be implemented? Would it be something new? And what was the second part? Okay, so on the first part, um, I'm, I'm not sure. So now that you're asking that question, what I'm really thinking is like maybe we could, instead of it going through, you know, maybe we could have a way to put that money to have it managed by uh, like credit unions or black owned banks, you know, as a way of diffusing power rather than just kind of like further concentrating like that contract. Um, but it could run through, I think that like it would probably borrow a lot of the infrastructure in terms of how, and, you know, how the policy would be implemented by the existing um, kind of channels. But I think that there's a way to do it thoughtfully. Um, and in terms of having restrictions on how people can use the money, so the, what the book of proposal does is establish a commission to study that question. Uh, because you could, I think one um, thought, one train of thought is that we would only allow the money to be spent on higher education or buying a house. And the idea would be, or like to start a business, it would be to create wealth that would live on rather than to consume that. Um, but also there's the idea that like, let's say you need a liver transplant and it's like, okay, well I have $100,000 but all I can do is buy a house, you know. Maybe people should be able to make their own decisions for themselves. Um, but then the other side of it is you could also be manipulated by people in your, in your environment, mm -hmm. you know, as a young adult, family members, and you also just might need to consume it. Maybe that helps you. So anyway, what they would do, I think it's, an, it's, a, it's a kind of an open <clears throat> question. I don't think that people are going to squander the money and just like throw it out. If you've seen like the Chappelle show skit about reparations, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what's gonna happen. Um, I think that it's, it's, um, it's, it would be like a massive thing that for many families would be really important. Um, but it's kind of an open question as to what is the most effective way to kind of like create that policy. Yeah. In, in the in the programs that exist in the United, the, the experimental pro programs, the IDAs and those things, they tend to have strings attached, and you can only use it for education or housing or you know those kinds of purposes. The UK one, there were no strings attached, and the IDAs people from the states were appalled. You know, what do you mean no strings attached? It's unconditional, and it was just felt to be too paternalistic to say to young people because other young people who inherited the wealth wouldn't have strings attached. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I just wanted to add a note about the structure question because I think that's a really interesting question because when you think about a universal program like this, I think the model of how the model that would probably mo make most sense is something that would be structured along the lines of social security yeah. because it's such a large program to manage. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, because when you think about the idea of, of even credit unions um, managing that type of money, you go back to 
the privatization debate around Social Security um, 15 years ago, and you think about if private organizations were managing that money, what would happen, what would be the restrictions on that, and what would happen with something like the financial crisis where you have these baby bonds that are managed by private organizations and then all that money is wiped out, so you're back at square one. So, uh, so I, I just said, I had never thought about that before until you asked that question, but I think that's a, an interesting question, so yeah. Um, further questions? <clears throat> Hey, good afternoon. Um, my name is Francis, and I'm an incoming student at the School of Social Work. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. It's pure fuel to the fire on my end. So, um, so I have one question for Naomi and one question for Jane. So, uh, Naomi, regarding uh, baby bonds, I know this might sound silly. You can throw away the question. We can talk about it later. But would you say your topic kind of correlates with the, um, I mean, how our country is trying to promote uh, financial literacy education in high schools, especially uh, to underserved youth. And for Jane, um, in one of your slides, you talked about uh, how the U.S. is the only rich country or developed country uh, uh, that doesn't offer paid family leave. Is there a country uh, that the U.S. could model off of, let alone be inspired by, that can further advocate and enact uh, paid family leave? Thank you. Um, what was the question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Financial literacy. High oh, yeah. Okay. No, I actually think it's, no, I mean, I can see that. Yeah, yeah. But um, the thing about financial literacy, especially for, like, I guess, poor families, is that, like, you can read it all you want. It still says zero, <laughs> you know? So financial literacy, I mean, I think that would be best used in tandem with something that actually gives you the finances to manage. Um, so all of our peer countries provide, last time I checked it was about 10 months of paid parental leave, so it's probably now up to about 12 months, so basically about a year of paid parental leave. So we are so far off from the mark. So, I mean, you could pick Canada, you could pick Australia, you could pick the UK, they're close to us, you know, in lots of different ways, but you could pick any country and they all offer at least a year of paid parental leave and they have some provisions for uh, family leave for other family reasons. I think the models, honestly, that are going to be more relevant are these new state laws. So New York's just went into effect last year. It's now eight weeks of paid leave. It's going to move up to 12 weeks. You know, the FMLA is 12 weeks of unpaid leave. So I think that's sort of where people would converge would be 12 weeks of paid leave. There is a bipartisan effort now in the Senate um, led by Senator Cassidy, who's Republican, and Senator Sinema, who's a Democrat, and a social worker, mm -hmm. interestingly enough from Arizona, Senator Cassidy's from Louisiana. And they're now being joined by a couple of colleagues from the Senate Finance Committee because the issue is about the financing of it. But there seems to be some consensus in Congress that there ought to be some paid leave for family reasons and possibly not just for parental leave, but for the broader set of family reasons that are covered under FMLA. So this is the first time there's been that kind of bipartisan effort um, I think it's not coincidental that it's on the heels of six states enacting the law and many other states. In some ways, it's becoming very difficult for business because depending on where you are, you have a different set of rules, and the rules are now changing every year because the laws are phasing in. So uh, there's not really that much business opposition to having something national that would just level the playing field. And we've been surveying employers, and the employers are you know, whatever, every state we've gone into, two-thirds of them are supportive and another 10 or 15 percent are neutral. So the opposition among employers turns out not to be there, even among small employers. So it, it looks like, you know, this is a train that's leaving the station, uh, which is very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, are there other questions out there? Yeah. I, Where was I had a quick question for our first speaker. Um, it looked like the programs that you were presenting would sort of bring down the poverty rate by about 30%. And I wanted to know your opinion about jobs on demand and also um, you know, increasing the minimum wage to recapture the gap that's been created from an increase in productivity to where wages are now. There are some estimates that the minimum wage would then have to be about 20 or $21 per hour. Do you think that that would have a, a major impact as well. Well, thanks for the question. <clears throat> I might 
defer, and, and Jane might have some kind of broader uh, picture comments on that. Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure. I, when I when I look at the at the estimates, I just try to think, you know, as proposed, what kind of um, what kind of implications do these have? Uh, I think that there's certainly room to have like some combinations of different of different type of policies, um, and that's what's kind of interesting. I think right now that there are so many people that are really proposing these progressive ideas that there's I've seen a lot of collaboration. It seems so. Uh, I think people are picking up things from other policies and and trying to kind of converge towards something that can address um, a few different things. So um, I'm going to I'm giving kind of a <coughs> vague answer perhaps, but uh, there there has been some work at the Poverty Center on like a job guarantee, uh, and we're also doing some work on what an, just an income guarantee could look like. Um, but I think that uh, somewhere along the lines, the right answer is you know, some mixture of, of these policies that creates a really good um, kind of uh, safety net. But and linking back to the previous <clears throat> panel, we're doing some work now with the poverty tracker data looking at minimum wages because we have minimum wage increases in New York City. and. Given the structure of the data, as you saw, we can look not just at employment and earnings effects, but we can look at effects on other outcomes like health and mental health and hardship and life satisfaction. So we're just getting underway with that, and um, we're really excited to be able to leverage the Robinhood data for that. So stay tuned, is what mm -hmm. I would say. I would also say that what we've also found in some of our poverty team meetings is that a lot of people uh, just can't work for disability, um, taking care of small children. And so the jobs guarantee would be really important for people who can work because they would have st stability, structure, they would have like decent working conditions if it was federally mm -hmm. mandated to have that. So it would be really important. But there's still going to be a lot of people who are going to be in poverty because they can't work. And that's when those kinds of safety nets would still be necessary. Mm -hmm. And just one more thing, there's, there's can't work and there's people who are actually working. They're just not working in the labor market. Yeah. Right? They're caring for people. They're caring for... Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So we have time for one last question. I think it's coming from this side. Hi, uh, my question's for Naomi. Um, I was since the baby bond doesn't you don't get that money until your early adulthood. I'm wondering how you're imagining, if at all, there's any effects in kind of the short term of like knowing that that money will be available to you in the future, and if that ha will have any positive effects, or if we can only really see those in like 20, 30 years down the line. I'm really interested in investigating that further. I mean, there are different kinds of responses that people could have. One could be that they're preparing better for the future because they think like I will actually have a way to do something with myself. Um, another thing could be maybe they would save less, which also might be good. Maybe they'll, you know, they'll know that they can like use whatever that they have because they don't have to save it. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know that there is a lot of, um, it's kind of a new concept to be like, but I guess there's probably information in terms of like social security, how people like reacted to that. So anyway, it's something that I, that I would like to explore further. I think it's an interesting thought. And um, I would, I guess, defer to hope. <laughs> yeah. I mean, our, our colleague Fred Suomalo looked at this in, um, several experiments that he ran in Uganda, giving mm. families matched savings accounts and mm. looking at the effect of assets on young people. And he found increased engagement in school, mm -hmm. uh, decreased yeah. risk of depression, decreased risk of risky sexual activity. Mm. So I think you're right that there would be, we would expect some behavioral effects and some improvements in well-being, but I don't think it's really been looked at much in the United mm -hmm. States. So it's a really great question. So we'd like to thank our panelists for this extraordinary presentation. Thank you guys so much. Um, so we have to get another break. We have a leisurely, a leisurely day. Uh, we'll be back here though at four and we'll do the last panel of the day and then uh, move to the reception.
Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Jason DeParl. I'm a reporter at the New York Times. I'm pleased to be here, um, as I know you all are. Uh, I was going to say uh, early on that this was going to be the good news panel uh, because this was the one that actually gets to um, the solutions, the things we could do to solve poverty, although the, f the previous panel um, did steal some of that thunder. 
But there's more good news because Jane just told me to uh, remind everyone that there are drinks after this <laughs> session. So we really are the, the good news um, panel still. Um, uh, maybe it says um, something about my inner cynicism, but um, I found myself surprised when I discovered that two members of Congress had succeeded in getting through Congress a um, permission and a mandate to study child poverty. That was, that was sort of news to me. So I guess that's also a bit of good news. Um, as uh, I'm sure many of you know, a report came out a few months ago on the results of that. The, the charge of the study was to examine um, three things. Uh, what is the evidence uh, of child poverty on child well-being? How does it affect kids? Uh, what is the anti-poverty impact of existing programs? And then it additionally asked the panel of experts uh, to recommend what uh, program or combination of programs could reduce by half both child poverty and deep poverty. Um, uh, it, it, uh, and the panel came up with some recommendations that we'll get to um, shortly. Uh, in reading through the study, the very good study, um, two sentences leapt out at me. Here's one. Uh, differences favoring children in more, uh, in more affluent families are already evident in the toddler's and preschooler's language, memory, self-regulation, and socio-emotional skills, with corresponding differences observed in neural structure and function in the brain regions that support these skills. Uh, I know that's no surprise to anybody here, but it still kind of leaps out at you when you, when you read it that um, uh, at age two or three, there's already brain differences, neural differences that can be observed. So um, it reminded me, I've been working um, mo most recently on international poverty issues, and uh, part of it is the effect of remittances when families, uh, when, when workers leave their families, go overseas and, and send back money. There's a study from Pakistan that shows that girls in families where they have a worker uh, in the Persian Gulf uh, are taller than in families that don't. Um, being because uh, they have more money and they're more willing to spend it on uh, on girls, which are lower priority in many rural Pakistani families. So um, I guess this is the, the the neural function is the American equivalent. Um, one other study that, or one excuse me, one other sentence that leapt out to me was uh, this one: If all countries' um, poverty rates were measured solely by the earned income of parents. U.S. children would have poverty rates that fell in the middle of rankings among peer, speak, peer countries, English-speaking peer countries. Instead, of course, um, ours fall at the bottom. So um, this uh, isn't just an inevitable function of uh, unequal market forces, but it's also a function of um, public policy choices. The panel, um, which included both Ron and, and uh, Irv, Ron Haskins and Irv Garfinkel, um, looked at uh, 10 different major anti-poverty programs, uh, EITC, SNAP, housing programs, um, and mo uh, job training, a long list. Uh, it modeled uh, two changes for each of them to see if uh, what the anti-poverty impact would that would be. Uh, in, for each individual program, um, they ranged from really quite small, like increasing the minimum wage would do not very much at all to reduce child poverty, to fairly large. I was particularly surprised by the difference uh, increased housing assistance could make, um, qu quite substantial. And of course, the child tax credit probably, I think, was the largest of all. But none of those 10 policies alone would be enough to meet the mandate of cutting child poverty in half. Instead, what did meet that mandate um, uh, was a combination of programs. Uh, there are four in the in the study. Um, one, the, the cheapest one costs nine billion dollars a year. Uh, this is basically an expansion of the EITC uh, the, uh, and the child tax credit. That, it's called the work package. Job training, work incentives, job training, raise the minimum wage, expand the EITC. It would cost nine billion dollars, which isn't a lot, uh, and it would put a million more people to work, and it would cut the child poverty rate by almost 20%, by 19%. Um, that's kind of the, if you look at the report, that's the one that didn't work, you know, that's the kind of failure, but if you look at it, geez, nine, nine, nine billion dollars, you could cut the ch child poverty rate by a fifth. Um, uh, that seems like substantial uh, uh, progress at a cheap price tag. They range on up to 100 billion in which you would cut the child poverty uh, by 55 percent, 
and also still put 600,000 people to work. So there are a lot of options. Um, I know Irv is, uh, um, there were two that uh, met the, the goal of reducing child poverty in half. I know Irv is um, particularly eager to talk about the differences between them. Our panel includes uh, Irv Garfinkel, professor of Columbia School of Social Work, Ron Haskins, uh, who played a uh, uh, senior scholar at Brookings Institution who played a key role in the 1996 uh, redo of the welfare system. Uh, Christine Brown James, the CEO of um, the Child Welfare League of America, and uh, Dolores Acevedo Garcia, professor at Brandeis. And we sorted out the order. Irv is going to go first, I believe. Is that right? Yeah. Thank you. I think everybody's going to give a two or three minute reaction to the report and then we'll go to questions. So what I'm going to do is uh, summarize the six points. Front. Can you hear? Is this I don't think right? the mic's on. You broke it. I don't think any of them are on. You were sitting here. <laughs> that was my plan. Okay. Can you hear me now? Okay. So I'm going to do... Uh, just six uh, points of summary from the report, and then a seventh point, uh, which I'll make at the end, which goes beyond the report. I should say all four of us were on the, were on the panel, uh, and that's why we're here today. So first point to make is that child uh, poverty is a serious problem for the United States. Uh, it compromises health, learning, development of our children and their future employment opportunities. And estimates indicate that the cost to the nation is about, of poverty, of child poverty, is about a trillion dollars a year. Uh, though, though there are a number of current programs and policies that are effective in reducing child poverty, 13% uh, of U.S. children, more than 9.6 million, are still living in, fa in families with incomes below the poverty line and nearly 3% are living in deep poverty. The highest poverty rates are found among Hispanic, Black, and Native American uh, children. Uh, third, it's uh, possible for uh, wealthy nations to reduce child poverty by 50%. The United States did so over a 36-year period from 1970 to 2016. The UK did so in under a decade from 2001 to 2008, and Canada is on course to reduce uh, child poverty in even fewer years, uh, beginning with its new child benefit in 2016. So the committee uh, developed 20 different proposals, none of which taken by themselves uh, was estimated to reduce child poverty by 50 percent, uh, but two packages of policies uh, were estimated to achieve the 50% reduction. Uh, and the cost of these programs are uh, relatively <coughs> modest or substantial, depending how you look on it, 90 to $110 billion. But they're small compared to the cost of child poverty, which is 10 times that. So. Um, the, the two uh, packages, one was a means-tested um, program and work package, and the second was a universal supports and work package. Both packages increase work by increases in the EITC and child care tax credit, and thereby both of them increase employment. The means-tested package increases SNAP, or food stamps, and housing benefits. The universal package converts the partially refundable uh, child tax credit uh, that's now 2000 per child. Uh, it increases that to 2700 per child, uh, and most important, extends eligibility to those with little or no earnings so it becomes a universal child allowance, and the payments are made monthly as opposed to annually. Uh, the universal package costs a little bit more. It reduces poverty a little bit more and increases work a little bit more. 
So the seventh point I want to make is, and here I go beyond the report, to note that the fact that a universal benefits approach costs only a bit more is remarkable, remarkable. And it's likely to make the universal approach more political feasible. Well, as usual, I'm going to make half as many points as are in half the time. <laughs> uh, the first thing is uh, that um, the, I want to just add to Jason's point that not only uh, did the Congress approve uh, the report and the request for the report, but they actually appropriated money for it, which normally they would not do for a report like this, and the vote was completely bipartisan. Pull the mic closer. Okay. If you want the people to hear me, Jason, you're slipping. Um, so that was, I, th I thought from the beginning, that was really, that was quite remarkable uh, because normally you wouldn't think Republicans would be too excited about yet another report on poverty, but they were. Um, and the report was, got a good reception from Republicans too. Second thing is, uh, I was extreme, I've been studying poverty all my adult life, uh, and I was extremely impressed not just with the quality of the people on the, on the, uh, on the committee, but also the quality of the report. Uh, for those of you who have a chance to look at the report carefully, if you happen to be teaching a graduate or undergraduate program in poverty, you couldn't do better than to use this report. I don't know exactly how you'd get a copy without paying $100, but it is full of all kinds of great stuff, very good analyses. It's a, it's, it's a great report. Uh, the third thing is I was surprised, uh, both from a perspective of, of analytics and from the seriousness of, with which the committee took uh, these issues about how ineffective work and Ron, merit. Let me try this one. You guys can't hear me? No. Well, you're about ready to have a test about whether it's better to hear me or not. <laughs> um, so, uh, um, work and marriage did not play much of a role in the report. It did somewhat afterwards. We did look at it carefully. We had a number of people come before the committee. We got some background papers. Uh, and as many of you probably know, there have been a number of studies, uh, including big random assignment studies. Uh, but if you're, if you're constricted by data, what an idea that is, uh, <laughs> you can't find high quality studies that say marriage. If you could. Now, you know, if you increase marriage, you could have a big impact on poverty. Everybody admits that right off the bat because kids who live in married couple families are about a fifth as likely to be poor as kids who live in single parent families. But try to figure out a way to increase marriage rates. No one has figured it out yet. So that kind of ruled it out for us. <clears throat> and then the final thing is cost. Uh, it was, to me, it was astounding how much our the big recommendations cost. Um, Herb didn't exactly skip this, but the two big packages that would reduce poverty 50%, one costs $110 billion a year, and the other one costs $91 billion a year. This comes out in a context in which the Trump administration would like to cut these programs, uh, and I think they'll give it a try. I don't think they'll succeed, but uh, they've tried before, and. You never know, but the idea that we would increase spending, I know you said that this is, modestly. Yeah, 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 modestly, but it ain't going to happen, y'all. Hi. Uh, well, uh, I was very um, uh, happy in the morning that we had a great discussion about some of the racial inequity aspects of poverty in the U.S., which are for me like um, a topic that we just must confront. We're gonna talk about poverty or child poverty. So of course the keynote was essentially about the importance of race in a number of different ways. And then we heard wonderful presentations about the wealth gap and the baby bonds that also spoke to that issue. So um, the report um, 
confront this issue of the racial, ethnic, and uh, nativity status differences in poverty in a number of different ways. I'm just going to talk about that briefly, and I hope that we can have a longer discussion later. So the first thing that we did, of course, is to um, present all the demographic data about the very vast differences in poverty by race, ethnicity, immigrant status. And um, so some facts are relatively well known, such as that minorities have higher poverty rates. Uh, Hispanics have a poverty rate, Hispanic children, of about 22%. And that is substantially higher than the overall poverty rate of 13% and about three times the poverty rate of non-Hispanic white children. Another uh, fact that is a little well less known is that today, Hispanic children are the largest group of children in poverty in the US. Um, they represent about 41% of children in poverty in the US, and that is up from uh, about 12% in 1970. Uh, white children represent about 31% of children in poverty, down from about 55% in 1970. So we not only have very unequal poverty rates, but we also have a very different composition of children in poverty that we had a few decades ago, and that has huge implications, all kinds of implications that I hope we can discuss later. Another way in which we address this issue of race, ethnicity, and immigration is by not only estimating the poverty reducing effects of all these individual programs and policies and packages overall, but also by subgroup. And I really encourage you to read the appendices that Ron was talking about, the 600 pages, and really delve into some of the richness of the data that we have. And um, of course, there are many nuances, but I think there are some really interesting overall patterns, uh, and I want to mention just a couple of them. Uh, the good news is that with uh, the packages um, that uh, we talked about a little bit in the beginning, the most generous packages that reduce poverty by about half, uh, those packages also have significant reductions in poverty for individual subgroups. Uh, the pattern overall is that African-American children tend to benefit more than the average from all these improvements in anti-poverty policy. And Hispanic children in general tend to benefit less, largely related to issues of immigration status. Um, there are some subgroups of children for which um, the problem of poverty is very persistent despite changes in policy because we didn't necessarily model all the most inclusive ways of addressing child poverty. So for example, non-citizen children, even with the most generous packages that we uh, proposed, uh, because we did not make those programs fully um, accessible to non-citizen children, uh, they don't really benefit from them. That's a relatively small group of children in relative terms, again, but it's uh, a very important group of children because they are very vulnerable kids and it's about 600,000 kids. So it's a lot of kids in absolute numbers, of course. And finally, uh, another way in which we address this issue of racial differences is by paying a lot of attention to contextual factors. So all these wonderful uh, presentations in the morning about what does it mean to have differential access to credit, to assets, to things that can buffer you from um, labor market shocks, from health shocks, all these different aspects of, that make poverty very, very difficult, of course, as an experience, but also affect the effectiveness of programs and tend to affect uh, uh, the effectiveness of programs more so for racial and ethnic minorities. So an example of a contextual factor that we consider is discrimination in employment and housing. Uh, a lot of the programs, of course, work by requiring that people are employed and then supplement wages. So to the extent that we have the racial discrimination in the labor market, which we know because we review the evidence again that that continues and affects disproportionately, particularly black families, but also Hispanic families. Any program that requires work is going to have a disproportionate requirement on these families. And housing discrimination also tends to limit the effectiveness of housing programs, even for otherwise similarly situated families, uh, white families and minority families, white families have an easier time using their housing vouchers, for example, to locate in neighborhoods with better resources for their kids. So those are just examples of the contextual factors we examined, and um, I'm very glad that we spent pretty much the whole morning, um, sorry, earlier part of the afternoon talking about those. So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I, I'm gonna add a couple of um, points to um, what 
was said about the context in which the, the um, group worked. Uh, first of all, it was a two-year-plus um, project. And um, the, it actually scanned two administrations. It was started under the Obama administration in a bipartisan way and supported in a real important way under the, the new administration. And I think that that is, is an important um, aspect of, of um, our work. The, the group that um, worked on the project, us, those of us sitting at this table and others was, I think, deliberately and intentionally diverse in terms of both the way we look, the way we think, our, our political perspectives. Um, and in addition to that, we were very, very fortunate to receive um, recommendations, suggestions, papers from a number of people, a large, large number. And we also convened some community meetings to hear directly from people in communities about how poverty was impacting them. So I think all of that is important context for, for the way we had to approach our work. Um, so I came into it as one of two that don't live in your world, the world of academics. And it was a real journey for me and um, until I found a way to make it work in my world, which is child welfare. And I think that there were, some, there were some themes across the work and across the learnings that apply both in child welfare and in, um, in this world of poverty. And I, I just want to share a few of them because I think they're important as we move forward. One is kind of the short term versus the long term. We were challenged with having to develop um, recommendations that were doable in a 10 year period. Very, very much anti my looking at early childhood development and family supports and things like that. Um, so that was, that was one thing, that there was that, that dynamic of short versus long term. And it's one of the major areas of questioning that we get um, as we go around and talk about the report. The other is a universal approach versus a targeted approach. You know, how do we find the balance there in saying it should be things that everybody should benefit from when we know that there are certain populations that need an extra push, an extra um, focus in order to really move forward. But in reality, again, it's both. It's long-term, short-term, and it's universal, plus specialized or targeted. The whole conversation around culture versus structure, you know, where, where people want to make that a political kind of conversation. And is it the culture of poverty or is it the structure that, and in reality, there's probably a little bit of both there also. Um, and then finally, the whole issue of research. Um, the incredible importance that I learned from my colleagues here and the others on the committee about the power of evidence and the need to not talk about TANF and other things that we may feel positive about because there's not enough research, unfortunately, on it. But on the other side of research is the value of other ways of understanding evidence other ways of involving um, communities and individuals in contributing to that understanding. So it sometimes gets set up as an either or, but in reality, as you know, it's both. So that whole you know, either or kind of thing exists in child welfare also. Um, the other couple of things um, quickly to mention that are, are in both worlds, the pervasive influence of race and ethnicity, both in the report that we did and in the world of child welfare, it's such a critical and pervasive issue. Um, and then connected to all of that is our huge discomfort in talking about all of this, in talking about is it culture or is it um, structure, what about race? I mean, all the things that we could be informed in improving, we are uncomfortable in talking about. And I think the report tries to find a balance in all of this there's a whole chapter, as Dolores mentioned, on the longer term things that we need to do and, and the short term things that get in the way that um, have to be addressed. But um, I'm hoping then that the report is going to stimulate the kind of conversation that we need to have on all the different issues that I just mentioned. I think it will. I think it already has. Yeah. Uh, Ron? You said, uh, I quote, uh, it ain't gonna happen, y'all. Could you unpack that a little bit? Um, 
I just cannot imagine any way, but don't forget Republicans still. Oh, 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 I got it. You were trying to hold the mic away from me. Uh, what, don't, what don't conservatives like about this? Okay, well, that's two questions. Uh, let me do the first one quickly. Um, Republicans still control the House and the presidency, and there's no way that I can imagine. I imagine under some very strange set of circumstances, you could get it through the House, you'd have to cut some kind of deal. Uh, but the, I can't imagine the administration would approve anything to spend $100 billion to reduce poverty. In fact, if anything, it's like they, they will support going the other way. There has been some response from Republicans that they did not like the report from conservatives. Let me say conservatives, whether they're Republicans. And I think there are several reasons. Uh, one is a, a number of Republicans called attention to the composition of the, of the committee, uh, that there were 15 people on the committee and 13 of them were, I would call, the Hall of Fame of left of center, you know, terrific analysts and people who have experience with public policy, and two, two conservatives. So, now from my perspective, those odds are about even. Uh, <laughs> but that was an issue for a number of people. Uh, the second thing is, of course, is the spending. That's been a big issue for a number of Republicans. There's no way we're gonna spend that much money. Um, and then the third thing, and I think the most important issue, and this raises a very large substantive issue, and that is the Republicans, in fact, this would be very good for graduate students. If you look at a, uh, a, a graph of the poverty rate since, say, 1960, and you see it goes up and up and up, and then starting about 1995, it starts going down, and we have one of the largest declines of poverty ever, uh, it, and it goes down to almost the lowest rate ever. In fact, you could call it the lowest rate ever. And Republicans say, that's because of work. Well, unfortunately, as I pointed out a few minutes ago, our assignment is to believe the evidence. And evidence will tell you, well, yeah, 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 work played a role, but don't forget the economy, one of the best economies, adding jobs right and left, uh, and don't forget these, the huge increase in the EITC, child tax credit, uh, and the other programs, and we're using the SPM, uh, so they made a huge contribution, and there's just no way around that. So if you're committed to making a database case, you can't make a strong case that work is what did it. So we were, I'd like to think, we were kind of trapped and a number of uh, conservatives have been very upset. They wrote letters to the committee. Uh, I got, I heard various things from former colleagues uh, that they were really upset that the committee didn't pay more attention. Because they didn't believe the evidence or because it didn't fit with the worldview? Okay, I wanna be careful here because I don't wanna say something that turns out to be unfair, but. I can't tell you the number of Republicans that have held up that graph. And they look at that graph and they say, nothing like this has happened before. And it's because of the work requirements. Now you could make that argument if you make it carefully because the other benefits are contingent on work in many cases, especially the big ones, earned income tax credit and so forth. So in order to get those benefits, you gotta increase work rates, which is what the bill did. Nonetheless, it wasn't just work. Furthermore, We've had these same requirements basically in place. Um, and but the, the, but the, wait, do, the decline in poverty. You can make a some million more ago. people work. For $9 billion, you can make a million hey, more people I, work. I, can, I have made that point so many times. To, but here's and my, can, so yeah, here's what's my response? conclusion. You're, channel it for okay, us. You're, no you're the representative of the. Ever community. say that I said this, okay? <laughs> for some Republicans, only a few. If it didn't, if the increase in work did not result from mandatory work requirements, it doesn't count. And our report did not have mandatory work requirements. And those impacts on, on increasing work by a million, I mean, that is amazing. When I saw it in there, I thought, oh boy, conservatives are gonna love this report. But, nope. Sir, can I, uh, I want to agree with Ron 
on the very first point he made, which is, but qualify it, which is it ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen as long as we have mm -hmm. Trump in the White House and as long as the Republicans have the majority in the Senate. I agree with that. That's uh, unquestionably correct. But we have an election coming up in 2020 which could change that. So that's the part I agree on. Um, I would say you mischaracterized the graph, and this is not accidental because I think Republicans are prone to do this. The biggest percentage reduction in child poverty took place in the 60s to the 70s. If you look at the graph, a huge reduction in child poverty because we may not remember that, but we increased AFDC benefits during that period. That's been a long time since we've actually increased, but we did. We added food stamps, and the reduction in poverty was quite uh, palpable, very big. And um, then we started cutting benefits. And uh, Ron is quite correct about characterizing what happened in the 90s. Uh, there was also a big reduction in poverty, but the idea that that was all because we um, uh, kicked women off of welfare uh, with work requirements and lifetime time limits, uh, we have good evidence on that, uh, that if that's all we had done, we actually would have increased, not reduced poverty. Uh, we have experimental evidence that uh, where we tried programs that only uh, implemented work requirements and we tried programs that implemented work requirements and supplemented, uh, supplemented earnings, the work requirements by themselves did nothing to reduce poverty. This is random assignment experiments, whereas poverty was reduced by programs that both increased benefits and had work requirements. Let me just take 30 seconds to clarify that was uh, the argument I made was that the work requirements brought the, the EITC, the increased EITC, a substantial increase in the EITC under Clinton and the child tax credit which was created in 1997 and the reason that those big benefits could have an impact on poverty one of the ways we were using is because work increased. So it was both work and the benefits. That was the point I was making. Either, either of you want to, Christine or uh, Dolores, you want to jump in on any of that? Just quickly, because I don't want to. Get in the middle of it. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, I do want to say that the frame of thinking that you have to have mandatory work requirements for people to work, that's the reason they're not working is something that needs to be explored a little bit more. And, and the fact that a lot of people who are poor work, and the ones who don't work often have challenges as described in our chapter eight that prevent them from working. And I think you have to put all of that together again to, and, and have the right outcome measures in mind um, before we start, I, otherwise the debate goes in the wrong direction, really. So, but poor people work. It's just, uh, many of them do. And the ones that don't are disabled or they are in living situations that prevent them from being able to work in many situations. Uh, Dolores, just to bring, bring this back to the pub current public policy context a little bit more. Um, we're all waiting on the public charge rule to come out of the Trump administration. Um, uh, what would you, how, how would you expect that to um, uh, affect uh, your findings? What, what will that do to um, uh, immigrant families in terms of the safety net? Just yesterday, the Urban Institute released a new report on their um, family well-being and basic needs survey showing that families are already avoiding or dropping off benefits because of the fear 
associated with the expanded definition of public charge. And what is extremely uh, concerning is that that's true overall, and as you can imagine, it's more true for Hispanic families, but also it's true among families in which people already have a green card and families in which people are already naturalized citizens. One of the issues talking about evidence and this negotiation of evidence that Chris was mentioning before, which I think is a key aspect of talking about poverty and as speaking in the morning, the keynote speaker was saying, being able to say these things honestly and try to talk about them, although they're extremely difficult, is uh, the issue of how much do we know that people are actually afraid and they are not gonna be able to use benefits because of that. So there was a lot of questioning about what is the extent of that evidence. And the evidence is coming from the great literature as opposed to academic papers mostly. So that is questionable in terms of like the, the standard of evidence that we are looking for. So uh, another aspect is that the simulations, which are fantastic, the TRIM3 model that we use, uh, we have to be very clear that what they are modeling is um, the usage of the programs, uh, employment effects, and I think our uh, committee, uh, particularly a few members of the committee that are very strong economists in this area, made substantial you know, improvements to the way we model employment effects, but there are many other things that are not included in the simulations. So we don't know whether immigrants have differential participation rates due to all these factors. Uh, but um, it's also very paradoxical, just I wanna say this in, in closing this, this comment in response to your question, that here we are, the reality is 25% of kids are growing up in immigrant families, up from 6% in the 1970s. And since 1996, our direction in policy has been to increasingly restrict benefits, not only for unauthorized immigrants, for legal immigrants in the US. We do that, that is uh, discrimination in eligibility by design. Even if people are eligible income-wise, they, if they are recent legal immigrants in the US, they cannot access benefits. Although Hispanics are the largest group of uh, people in the US raising children today. Uh, families with children are more prevalent among Hispanics than among any other group. So our demographic reality, the way we have designed programs to increasingly ex exclude immigrants and the direction in which we are going is just all completely misaligned to say that generously. Sorry, that's taking off my committee hat because we have to do that. <laughs> Yeah, um, I was very glad that Chris spoke uh, to the process that we follow as a committee, because I think that's very important to understand. This is a consensus committee. And uh, when I was invited to participate and I heard it was a consensus report, consensus committee, I really didn't fully understand the, the huge power of that. And I am incredibly proud that we were able to negotiate that. Because it's, first of all, just in terms of everyone being on the same page about the facts, I was so glad that Ron and Don and other people on the committee were able to read all the information again about immigrant eligibility for the 50th time, because this is a policy area that first of all has become incomprehensible, again by design, so that families and everyone is even more unclear about eligibility and more afraid to access programs or even ask. So uh, there were two proposals that we considered. One of them was restoring uh, benefits in terms of means-tested programs that were restricted after welfare reform for legal immigrants that had been in the U.S. for less than five years. Um, and then there was another more ambitious proposal, which was let's make means-tested programs eligible to everyone regardless of immigration status. So that was the, those were the two immigration policies that we considered in terms of the individual policies that we uh, estimated effects for. 
And then in terms of the packages, the last one, which is our most universal inclusive program, also includes that, uh, the, the one uh, that is about restoring eligibility for people that were not eligible after welfare reform. So it's not everyone, but it's that. However, and uh, it's, it's, I mean, even uh, for all of us that are obviously very aware of everything that we did for the report, it's incredibly complicated because we also have the tax credits and the tax credits are not eligible for, um, are not available, sorry, for uh, kids that are not um, holding a social security number, right? And that was changed with the tax reform of 2018 because prior to that, the child tax credit was available to kids that had a tax identification number, not a social security number, but that was reversed. So our policies also have a number of different uh, specifications in terms of that, but it's just such a, uh, a world of complexity in terms of how we are treating immigrants. And again, this is not a very small poor part of the population. It's a very substantial part of the population that um, is, it requires a lot of you know, clarity. We actually have some requests from um, a couple of groups, like First Focus, to clarify exactly what we did in terms of immigrant eligibility, because it, you know, this, this is the type of thing that goes into a 150-page report that goes program by program, et cetera. So it's, um, but I'm, again, very proud that we were able to reach consensus on that. Um, I, let me just add to that one quick little thing. I was with the Ways and Means Committee. We have jurisdiction over a lot of welfare policies, including uh, treatment of non-citizens and what kind of benefits they get. And our committee wrote the first rule to reduce benefits for non-citizens and impose the five-year rule. Uh, and I was involved in drafting that benefit. Uh, and I, by virtue of my position on the committee, I wound up defending it many times, publicly and privately. Uh, then move forward, you know, 10 years or whatever it was, and now I'm on the committee, uh, and we're a consensus committee, as you pointed out, um, and also we have already implemented a number of rules that did make work, uh, much stronger work requirements in the welfare law, and so I didn't have any problem just kind of closing my eyes and let that <laughs> thing go. Uh, uh, most of all because I didn't want Irv to be mad at me. So um, so I didn't have any trouble, and Don and I talked about it. This is Don Winstead, who was the other conservative on the committee, uh, who was a huge welfare guy in Florida. He run every welfare program there ever was in Florida. Uh, and he agreed that we ought to, that we should accept the judgment of the committee. And but, but you weren't endorsing it, right? You were just modeling it. You were just saying this is an option. No, we, we were. It, if you don't resist it and you're on a committee, that's endorsement. Could I have now, you came out in favor of welfare for immigrants? I would say yes. Oh. Uh, now, i got to tell you something. Is that, is Clay, that off the record? Clay Shaw, no. Is it, Clay, you're on Clay, tape. Clay Shaw, who was chairman of the subcommittee and was responsible for drafting these provisions, died. So he'll never know. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I would. <laughs> no, no, it was before. <laughs> so uh, I think it's important just to put this in context. Uh, what Dolores said, we now have a huge portion of our children are Hispanic and immigrants, and which means that that trillion dollar cost that we incur annually by virtue of allowing those children to be poor, uh, if we don't uh, eliminate those restrictions, that cost will continue. So I, I think we've got evidence, and, and I think the evidence drove, uh, drove the report in this case. Herb, don't, yeah. don't you think the, a better way to state that would be a disproportionate share of the cost is due to immigrants. Even if we solve the immigrant problem, we'd still have a poverty problem. And yes. Okay. Like right. that. okay. Yeah, and just in, in terms of your comment of uh, whether we endorse, what do you say exactly? Restoring welfare to immigrants or something like that. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that we as a committee, what we endorse, uh, what Ron was referring to, is that we agreed on the policies that we should examine. 
and we we put that one forward, rest restoring um, what we um, restricted after welfare reform for immigrants. And we also put forward the possibility that immigrant status would not even be a factor in eligibility for means-tested programs, right? People uh, are now able to evaluate what are the relative effects of those things and also to, uh, to see some of the other benefits, right? Because we argue that one of the reasons that we consider the immigrant uh, uh, restoring immigrant eligibility were two things. Uh, one, the demographic importance of children of immigrants, and another one was this notion of social inclusion that several committee members felt very strongly about in terms of including in the criteria that we consider. Now, I think that it's not our position that any of these programs or packages, it's not our position as a committee that any of this is preferable. But they are out there, and what we endorse is that they are important enough and promising enough and their demographic you know, importance of uh, some groups uh, merits that we consider them very seriously. So that's what the report is about. Can I add just one thing? Let me add one thing, I'll take 10 seconds, and that is I, I assure you that if this package actually got voted on, that provision would be a target for Republicans. That provision would be get, I'm not saying it wouldn't absolutely for sure be defeated, but it would be a huge controversy among Republicans. So, but that was not our focus on the committee. It may have been in the back of everybody's head, but the focus was where did the evidence take us? I don't think we, I can't remember more than one or two times where we talked about what would the Republicans do with this or what would the Democrats do with this? And I think it's important to, to say that, that we were really trying to look at where does the evidence take us. And I think that there was a balancing of the recommendations across work and that we tried hard to give people um, all kinds of options to be able to work on, no matter where they came from on the political sphere. Except I would not want this sophisticated audience to think that Republicans and Democrats in Congress are gonna hold hands and sing kumbaya uh, on the recommendations in this report. There are a number of them that are really controversial and would not make it through Congress, which the composition could change and we could have a different president and then who knows. Sure. Well, you know, we're having a debate in child welfare because of some of the changes around Family First that require that certain programs reach a certain level of evidence. And there are, and that's a good long-term objective, but the reality is there are lots of programs that, that for which we could get evidence in a different way from a long-term, you know, academic research project that would demonstrate that they're making a difference and that we could um, operate long enough to allow for some of the more sophisticated um, evidence to come in. And in addition to that, I think that you need a variety of sources of evidence, particularly when you're working with low-income families where the issues are so complicated that if you, most of the, the research is looking at a specific program and its impact. And the reality is you really need to step back and look at a variety of programs and how they inter interact with each other and ultimately impact the end um, user. So I'm just, I'm just a real advocate for research, of course, but I want us to have a broader definition of research as we move forward and in particular include the families in, in my world, families and children in some way. And service providers. And service providers, yeah. I was struck by the numbers on the housing, how, how much of an anti-poverty benefit you could get from increased housing assistance. Anybody want to talk about? There were two, two were roughly equal in their impact. One was expanding the um, child tax, um, turn that into a child tax, refundable child tax credit, and the other was housing. Uh, what are the arguments for 
how do they work differently? Is there an argument that one's better than another? How, how should we think about um, the similar amount of anti-poverty impact you get from that? So the, uh, there's actually a fourth package that um, was in there. That's a universal package, but only, um, can you hear me? That only uh, took the uh, a child tax credit and extended it downwards. And that package uh, costs only about 25 billion, I forget the exact number, but reduced child poverty by only 30%. So it didn't, uh, so what's interesting is that given our current child tax credit of $2,000 per child, uh, it's dirt cheap to e extend downwards. The only people who aren't eligible are the very rich, and no one proposed to increase uh, eligibility there, and the very poor. So the very, everyone else gets the $2,000 per child tax credit. So it's incredibly cheap to extend that down, and, um, and it's incredibly targeted because the bulk of the population is- Tell us what incredibly cheap is. 20, 20, 25 billion dollars, something like that. Uh, so the housing allowance also is relatively well targeted because it's means tested. Whereas if you did the child allowance, it wouldn't be means tested. There's lots of idiot. And what was that? the housing proposal was to uh, make it a guarantee if you met the criteria that you would get it as opposed to a No, waitress. I think we increased uh, participation to 70%. So okay, it right, was right, right. not fully funded. Okay. Uh, currently only about 25% of people who are economically eligible actually get a child subsidy. So the proposal was to increase funding so that we could get up, I believe, to 70, maybe it was 75 um, percent. They both, they both do a, a very good job of reducing uh, poverty. I think the um, a critical difference is, uh, has to do with human dignity, I would say. So we have tried a lot in this country and other countries as well to make means-tested programs um, look like universal programs. That they're not, we've tried to not make them stigmatized. We've uh, gone through a lot of effort to do that. Uh, and I think relatively successful with some programs uh, for the aged, uh, supplementary security income is means tested but works pretty well. The disability portion now is under attack, under attack. So if you're disabled and getting supplementary security income, it's not like a universal program. Uh, you're mo much more likely to feel I wish I didn't have to get this benefit. I need it, but I wish I didn't have to apply for a means-tested benefit. That is certainly true for programs with children. So right now, TANF and increasingly food stamps uh, under attack, and so people who get the benefit, uh, they themselves feel like, I wish I didn't have to have this. Nobody feels that way about a child allowance precisely because it's universal. I think that makes a huge difference. Thank you. So um, if this must work a boulder from an ideological point of view is there, it's immovable. It sounds to me from what you're saying is that the EITC is, is probably gonna be the best way to go in terms of reducing uh, child poverty. Would you agree with that? No. <laughs> I think we have to overcome this uh, fixation on work. 
I, th I would agree with my fellow panelists that the evidence is pretty strong that either the poor are working or that there are barriers. Uh, they're caring for someone. Uh, I actually, when we, if you go back to the TANF debate, at one point I favored work requirements uh, because I thought they would be, could be and would be implemented humanely. Uh, what we already knew that about a quarter, somewhere between 20 and 25 percent of the old AFDC caseload, the mothers were suffering from depression. So what happens with a mother suffering from depression? It's hard to show up for a work requirement. You're depressed, so <laughs> you don't show up. So rather than saying that should be a sign that that mother needs help, we just kick them off. I don't think that was good. But uh, the, this, this isn't a debate about work versus non-work because all these proposals increase work. Yeah, I was going to say, in order to pass any of these, I think you have to show it has positive impacts on work. If you look at our little report, you'll find out that the, fir the first of our proposals would increase actual work. One million people, more people would work as a result of that proposal. And it's because of a very sophisticated idea, which is if you want more of something, pay for it. And so the package is loaded with benefits for work, EITC and so forth. And in that sense, I think the EITC could make a big difference. And I think that would be, if I were, uh, let's say the next president is Romney, and I'm his policy advisor, I'm going to say, we're going to go for this first package, and we're going to have <laughs> I can't wanted, believe uh, I just wanted yeah. someone else besides me. <laughs> okay. To hear what All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, quite a surprise to me. But uh, um, so I think it, it, politically it could make a big difference, and I think Republicans, it, if it, if the package is sweetened with positive with outcomes, where more people work, never mind all these issues that bring up uh, that Republicans would uh, could support it, especially because. This proposal only costs nine billion dollars. Now, we so you, could you think not that's sell sellable? What? You think that's sellable? Yes, I definitely do. Um, and yeah. we could not, we could not support that because we were restricted by the requirements of uh, our charge. We had reduced poverty by fifty percent, and that doesn't need it, so we couldn't do it. But Ron, isn't um I mean, isn't the reality that there are people for whom pushing their ability to work and supporting their ability to work is going to make a difference? And that if but if we're really going to solve poverty in this country, we have to get to the people for whom that's not true. And it, particularly as, a, as our population is aging, as there's more chronic illness, I mean, all the research that we saw on the health, in the health area says that um, the impact of stress is better known, the impact of, of depression. All these things say if we only focus on getting people to work, we're never going to have a long-term impact on poverty in this country. And that's where I worry about it, the focus being. And I understand the politics, you know, of what Republicans will or will not. But we also have a responsibility to help people understand that a lot of people can't work and maybe we can help them get to work by giving more mental health services. I mean, it's such a dilemma to say we're going to cut health care, but we want more people to work. I mean, to me, it just is mind boggling. And maybe I'm the flaming liberal, but I'm not on the group. <laughs> okay, you think I am here. Hi, I have a question in the back. Um, so I, I'm intrigued by some of these proposals. I'm concerned about uh, the burden on mothers uh, because if the idea is for people to work um, and we understand that the links between a single uh, parenting and poverty are really strong, uh, it also seems that uh, we're basically putting an onus on mothers. And so I'm curious what 
you know, what, what discussions around gender and motherhood, especially in light of the fact that we don't have paid leave uh, and other benefits, um, you know, what, what were some of those considerations around the gender uh, dynamics and also the discrimination against uh, black and brown men, for example, in the labor market and what that all means? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No. Uh, so we're about ready to leave. So I will say that I think that issue was settled years ago. And Americans, polls show this over and over again, they do not have objection to federal policy requiring women to work, even if they're single women. And we do have a number of provisions that at least help with child care. They're way better than they were 10 and even and better than they were 20 years ago. So I don't think I don't think that argument will work. I think you could. I think especially if Jane leads the charge, uh, you could improve the policy in a gradual way, and we could have more money for child care and all that kind of thing. But I I don't think that there's a lot of sympathy to say all oh, mothers have big burdens and therefore they shouldn't be required to work. What? Maybe it is. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm just. Okay, a couple of comments on that. Uh, as I think Chris mentioned, the time frame for the, uh, these effects to happen in terms of the report is 10 years. So that meant that we didn't consider um, a lot of structural issues such as gender inequality, attitudes about gender, and some of the factors that contribute to this marriage market in which a lot of women uh, choose to be single, which of course are very important structural reasons why that is the case. So we didn't really look into those factors as structural issues that drive poverty. And of course, that's a very important issue to consider. And we said at a presentation a couple of weeks ago at Brookings that we obviously would like to see now another committee that would examine those structural factors. That was not our charge. We were charged essentially to examine the effects of federal policy that could reduce poverty in a 10-year frame. Uh, they are really, really interesting uh, policies, uh, and I was very glad that Jane talked about family and medical leave, for which we, and I agree with Chris that the discipline of having to look at the evidence is essential. We don't have enough evidence. So one aspect of family and medical leave, which I learned about after reading a lot of the literature to try to write up that section in chapter seven of the report, is that we don't know, for example, the employment effects of family and medical leave, in particular among low-income women. We just don't know. So you, don't have, you cannot plug that into a simulation of what would happen to child poverty. And we don't have, we are beginning to see estimates of what would happen to poverty if we adopted paid family and medical leave. But that's just emerging, as I hear that a few groups are looking into that now. So that was, um, I think that was another challenge. And uh, so, in, Finally, another thing I want to say about uh, women and parenting and work um, that you know, builds on what Chris said before, I think that we have to really much better understand what is the context in which families are operating. And uh, it's very difficult to do a report that is not looking at those issues more carefully, but again, that was not our charge. So just to give you an example, we look into this issue of SSI and some of the studies, very strong economic studies that I read about children's SSI, show that basically if you reduce SSI benefits, uh, families are not worse off in terms of poverty. The reason for that is because there is a lot of um, work elasticity, so parents go and work. So a lot of people read that evidence as those families don't really need SSI because they can work. No, I can assure you that they do need um, SSI because the trade-off is, of course, caregiving that a parent can provide for a disabled child, which probably has a huge value in terms of economic value as well as that child's development. And that is not estimated in what we are looking at. So we have to recognize the limits of the type of approach that we took, which we did very carefully and very seriously, but we have to be very honest about that. And I would say, particularly to this group, there's a, a set of recommendations around research that's needed. Um, we, we bumped into so many, and not just research, data collection that's needed. We don't know enough about a number of the subpopulations that we wanted to understand better. We don't know enough about the interconnection between some of these contextual issues and how programs work. 
And that's an area that is really um, sitting there for research that any of you in this room could start to look at. Because many of the recommendations we wanted to make around parental leave and other things we could not make because there wasn't evidence there to support it. Can I make uh, just one final point coming back to the EI coming back to the EITC and the packages. So every single package included the EITC. Every single package included the EITC and included uh, some, some child care as well. Those are pro work uh, and they were in there for that very reason. But if you only do work, you can't, that's the message of the first package, you can only reduce poverty by 20%. In order to get to the 50% target, you need to either increase the means-tested programs, housing subsidies and food stamps, or you have to uh, extend the child tax credit uh, downwards uh, to make it eligible for those who with zero or low earnings. You can't reduce poverty by half, child poverty, without doing one of those two. And that's consistent with the historical record within the U.S. It's consistent with looking across countries the way we've reduced poverty everywhere in the rich world is through income transfers, some of which increase work, some of which decrease work. And that's why we went to packages. As the social policy analyst Jimmy Buffett once said, it's 5 o'clock somewhere. It's time for the reception. Thank you all. Please give a round of applause to our panel and join us in the adjacent room. Thank you.